Members, take your seats, please. Members, take your seats. The House will come to order. Members, take your seats. And turn on your voting stations. The Chair recognizes the member from Auburn, Representative Osborne, who rules that the House adjourned from the session of May 18, 2023. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed nay, the ayes have it, and the House is adjourned. The House will attend to a prayer by guest chaplain, the member from Exeter, the Honorable Alexis Simpson.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, colleagues and guests. It is good to be together here today. Let us pray. O oh, Divine Comforter, we come today with heavy hearts for our colleague, Representative Janvrin, who has recently lost his son. We pray today that you will provide comfort, care, and strength to him, to the entire Janvrin family, to their friends, and to their whole community. And please continue to show us how to be a community of compassion for him in the upcoming months and years. As we all turn our hearts and our minds to the work of the legislature today, please give us the ability to carry out our work in the midst of the challenges of day-to-day -day life. Center us this morning as we join our hearts in an interfaith adaptation of the prayer attributed to St. Francis. Source of all that is holy, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is sadness, joy, and where the shadows fall, may we still find warmth. O Divine One, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in caring for the vulnerable that we find purpose. Amen. The chair recognizes the member of Hudson, Representative John Ulrich, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Chair recognizes the Elvern High School B Naturals from Hudson, who will now sing our national anthem.
House will attend to requests for leaves of absence. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the day, illness, Representatives Hatch and Siebert. The day, important business, Representatives Bickford, Catherine Harvey, Hull, Genesian, Mason, Mark Pearson, and Tatro. These leaves will be granted unless otherwise ordered by the House. House will attend the introduction of guests. Mr. Speaker, please welcome fourth grade students from Wheelock Elementary School, guests of the Keene delegation. They are with us in the gallery today. Welcome to the New Hampshire House. The House will attend to a communication. Mr. Speaker, in a letter dated May 31st, 2023, Dear Paul, please be advised that the following representative-elect was sworn into office by the Governor and Council on this day. Hillsborough County District 3, Mark W. Plamondon. Sincerely, David M. Scanlon, Secretary of State. Welcome to the New Hampshire House. The House will now attend to the consent calendar. Mr. Speaker, from the Committee on Election Law, CACR 9, removed by Representatives Filio, Stephen Smith, Ellen Reed, Germana, Newell, Aaron, Harley, Sellers, Spillane, and Doucette. From the Committee on Executive Departments and Administration, Senate Bill 107, removed by Representatives Carol McGuire, Groda, Shewitt, Simon, Fred Davis, Tony Leckis, Post, Gerhard, Alicia Leckis, and Dan McGuire. Are there any other bills removed from the consent calendar? Representative Osborne moves that the consent calendar with the relevant amendments as printed in the day's House record be adopted. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. And the consent calendar is adopted. House will attend to the regular calendar. Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety to which was referred Senate Bill 58, an act relative to arrest without a warrant while in care of the medical profession on a premises of a residential care or health care facility. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator David Muse for the majority of the committee. The committee amendment is 1490H, printed in House Record 27, pages 28 through 29. Are you ready for the question on the committee amendment? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. And the committee amendment is adopted. Bills on second reading open to further amendment. Representative Hines. Representative Hines here. Office Floor Amendment 1834H, printed in House Record 27, pages 29 through 30. Chair recognizes Representative Hines. Chair recognizes Representative Hines to speak. Thank you. Uh, I believe this amendment is good. Uh, improves upon the underlying bill. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I believe this amendment is good. Improves upon the underlying bill. Uh, I believe there are some problems with, with this bill, so I'd ask for your support. Thank you. Chair recognize Representative Roy. Um, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't know what he just said, but whatever it was, it's wrong. Please, um, <laughs> please vote against that. 
Representative Hines has requested a division. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. The House will come to order. This is going to this is going to be a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Roy for a parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, if I don't know what this amendment does, I probably would not vote for it. Neither should you. Please vote red. Thank you. The motion before us is the Heinz Floor Amendment 1834H. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 43 voting A, 323 voting A. The amendment fails. Bills on second reading open to further amendment. Representative Mannion offers floor amendment 1835H, printed in House Record 27, page 30. Chair recognizes Representative Mannion to speak to his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment looks to clarify the situations where warrantless arrests are permitted under the committee amendment. The committee amendment mentions actual or threatened violence, and this amendment changes that language to specifically reference statutes for assault, domestic violence, and criminal threatening. Further, the committee amendment broadly scopes the justifiable scenario for arrests to include interfering with, quote, services that, li that a licensed medical professional has determined to be medically necessary. What we've learned over the last couple of years is that medically necessary is much more of a moving goalpost than you'd assume. This amendment will clarify that by, by more appropriately referencing statute for emergency care. I believe expanding the authority of police to make warrantless arrests is dangerous to liberty and adding text to this section of RSA should be extremely precise and only when absolutely necessary. Please support this amendment by pressing the green button. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Roy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the previous speaker for a cogent argument. Um, what this bill does, and unfortunately, um, I have to take this very seriously, one of, our, one of our own members isn't here today because of the situation that this bill brings up, Representative Adjani. What this bill does is if you assault or threaten violence in a hospital, and it interrupts medically necessary care, you can be arrested when the police get there. Now, the interrupts necessary care, I put in there to protect citizens. That means if you're in the waiting room and someone says, hey, put your mask on, 
and you say, make me put my mask on, you can't be arrested because you're not interrupting medical care. You have to be interrupting medical care, necessary medical care, to be arrested under the statute. As it stands now, you can be getting treated, punch your doctor in the nose, the police can get there, they can't do a darn thing, they have to go get a warrant, come back, and by federal law, they still have to treat you. They can't kick you out of the hospital. All this does is let the police get there and say, when you're finished being cared for, you are under arrest. And it protects the hospital. We have left our, our medical providers hanging in the wind. During COVID, they were heroes. And now, we don't even want to protect them. We need to do what we can. But I agree, not giving too much power. The original bill we got from the Senate had um, the ability of a hospital janitor to hold you until the police got there. And that was ridiculous. We tuned this down as far as we could go to still allow the police to protect the medical care professionals and not let citizens be unnecessarily held or their liberties interrupted. Again, it has to be interrupting necessary medical care. That means not at the front door, not in the waiting room, not anything else unless you interrupt someone. Picture one of your family members is in a car accident and your child is getting service in the next room and the doctor can't tend to them because some drunk has punched a doctor in the face. Would you want them arrested? I would. Thank you. I ask you to support the as is. Thank you. The motion. Support the bill. Vote red. The motion before us is the floor amendment 1835H. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. The noes have it. Floor amendment fails. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it. Committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Education to which was referred Senate Bill 213, act relative to educational institution policies on social media. Having considered the same, brought the same with the following amendment and a recommendation of the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Rick Ladd from the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority report with the following resolution resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Senator Valerie McDonald from the minority of the committee. Committee amendment is 2061H. Printed in House Record 27, page 51. Question is on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it, and the committee of members have adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment, and the chair recognizes Representative Belcher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, colleagues. I've taken the unusual step this morning of signing up to be a second speaker on a bill and against this bill, uh, something I hope to not make a habit of, but I feel very strongly about this bill and you need to hear why. First of all, we did hear, um, rather we did have a subcommittee on this bill. We entertained and heard expert testimony on this bill. We heard that this bill, which modifies the language in existing law to exempt certain social media uses and platforms from the definition of social media such that they can be brought in as parts of classes in our public schools. So we heard that this bill will subject students to the potential danger of private messages enabling predators to potentially contact students. We heard from the standpoint of data and privacy that there could in fact be breaches of student data and privacy and there is no real recourse because this bill is particularly aimed at one platform, the LinkedIn platform, though it could apply to any platform, but Microsoft owning the LinkedIn platform will not negotiate a data agreement. We have to go with a standard data agreement which waives basically all of, all of the students' rights. 
Finally, as far as the major problems here, this bill would place students within the context of their public school classes under the terms of service of third party social media. That includes speech codes and codes that can restrict freedom of association. It would subject them to any number of punitive things that could interrupt their coursework. And I'd like to make a couple points just from very recent history in the news that really articulate this point. First of all, the LinkedIn platform kicked off the third major GOP contender for the Republican presidency primary two weeks ago, removed from their platform for criticizing the Chinese Communist Party. LinkedIn has been linked to federally sponsored censorship in coordination with the State Department. Finally, just yesterday, our governor issued an executive order regarding the negative effects social media has on the mental health of minors. There's no need for this bill. The, the items, the badges that they can access through social media are not industry recognized credentials. They don't do anything to certify you as capable of doing a job. They're simply quizzes that you take online that if they desire to, they can certainly do from home. They do not need to be a part of any classroom study. And finally, the things that they do need to access in the classroom through digital platforms that are not social media, they can already access under existing law. There is no upside to this bill. It is all downside. I would ask you to protect freedom of speech and association for schools and students by voting no, or uh, yes, by voting no and allowing another motion to be made. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I echo the remarks of my colleague from Wakefield. My professional social media accounts have had not one, not two, but three false suspensions and within the past few weeks have been impersonated twice. This means someone is pretending to be me. Partly due to these recent events, I am speaking today because it takes someone of my generation to protect those even younger from falling victim to harmful predators. Senate Bill 213 fails to recognize that child safety is paramount. Instead, students would be subjected to the whims of technology manufacturers, completely outside the realms of education. School districts are unable to negotiate with third-party social media platforms. As a result, Students are subjected to terms of service that can change at any moment. Updates could limit speech by penalizing students for ideological beliefs, causing the loss of job prospects and further consequences. Adolescents who are still determining personal ideologies should not fear unemployment for current violations of third party terms of service yet to exist. Proving to be a gateway to the future, New Hampshire's career and technical education courses have allowed high school students to take part in programs of study leading to industry recognized credentials. These students are more competitive job applicants with lower rates of unemployment and higher job satisfaction. Senate Bill 213 hinders the successful CTE model by inhibiting students from obtaining these credentials, stunting Granite State ingenuity, and compromising student privacy. At no point is teacher, student, or parent consent required before unauthorized users can interact with children's profiles. In other words, data cannot be protected 
from unwanted access. And school districts have limited ability to intervene even when students' safety is jeopardized. So if it were to become law, Senate Bill 213 would needlessly harm children. I implore you, my distinguished colleagues, to join me in voting against the motion. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Ladd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 213 was a very controversial bill in the Education Committee, and you've heard the minority present that position. The language which we have as amended, there are three primary points in the amendment. And the language has been approved by legal staff at the Department of Education. The first question we have is, shall not Shall social media not apply to platforms used for demonstrating evidence in student career development? So our career technical education centers, staff, directors, etc., able to use social media as an instrument to help students receive these industry-recognized credentials, which we hope all our students are leaving career technical education with. The curriculum in these centers is aligned with industry now. Industry is posting all this on social media. We're looking at areas such as engineering, automotive, health sciences, construction, culinary, all the services provided through our center. And instruction leads to, as I said before, these recognized credentials so students leave with a job in hand, and a good paying job at that. So why do we need the social media? When I was looking at social media the other day in terms of my grandson who is taking courses this summer at Tuck Business School as an internship, I had to work through LinkedIn to get there. And so access to industry standards is now available on these sites. LinkedIn is a business and employment focused social media platform. platform. Platform primarily used for professional networking and career development and allows students to post their credentials and employers to post jobs and vacancies where these students are looking. The question arises, should a young adult enrolled in a CTE program be provided the opportunity to, to obtain an industry-recognized credential by using a social media platform, and who makes this decision? The second part to the amendment deals with some of the issues that the minority presented. It says, written parental permission must be attained by the CTE Center in order for a student to be on the platform written parental permission. Not the state saying you can't get on. Who is responsible? Who has the rights for that education? We've debated this on this floor many a time. I believe parents have the right to say yay or nay. Not the state and not somebody else in this house right here. I believe firmly in parental rights. And there was a discussion about freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of choice. If we don't pass this bill, we're impinging upon that freedoms that the family is able to make. Now, thirdly in the amendment, technology platforms and services used by students at the CTE Center must be part of the student's approved program of study. That means they can't use that platform at all unless it's part of that program and they're at the school at that time, the student is working on it with the director or the instructor. The LEA plans, every local education agency has to have a policy in place regarding data, personal privacy, and use of these platforms. And that's a requirement that every district must have. So it's a local control issue, and they are working on this with a consortium amongst all the school districts. 
So in summary, guardrails have been put in place for use of any online platform while you're at school. Platforms must be approved as part of the approved program of study. Parental permission, opt in, not opt out, opt in. That means a written form has to be signed by parent for a student to use this while in that CTE course. The amendment has been approved by two attorneys at the Department of Education. It's been requested by our CTE directors, by our staff, by the CTE Advisory Council, by various businesses. We need these folks to come out of schools with a credential, a certificate in hand. And by doing this with a supervisor at school, there's less opportunity for a student to get into trouble and get in somewhere that's not safe rather than doing it home alone. Reality, high school students are already using these platforms. This amendment tightens online platform use in accordance with approved programs that we have in the school district or we have in statute here. So it is a local control issue, and this amendment only carves out one exception, and that's for career technical education. And we need more students, more people in this state coming out prepared for this, the careers that we need filled in this state right now. So please support this bill by pressing the green button. Thank you. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats. Roll call has been requested. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. The motion before us is a majority committee report of order passed as amended on Senate Bill 213. This is going to be a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Cortello for a parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, if I believe that schools should not be promoting the usage of social media, especially considering the recently issued executive order by the governor, which addresses the negative impacts of such online outlets. If I know that this bill does not sufficiently address safety concerns, such as data privacy and online predators, while it does expose students to arbitrary third-party terms of service, if I know that career and technical education programs can provide the industry-recognized credentials that students need to be successful in their future careers without having to use social media platforms such as LinkedIn, would I now press the red button and protect students from the negative aspects of social media platforms? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognize Representative Cornell for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know, as a two-term member of the Career and Technical Education Advisory Council, that this bill has been requested by potential employers, such as the hospitality and auto industries, numerous times, and if I know that the parental opt-in language ensures that parents and custodial caregivers of students under the age of 18 
are aware of data and privacy protocols used by districts when students use digital platforms. And if I know that virtual or electronic resumes in the form of online portfolios are the industry standard for job seekers, and that access to these platforms, including those with assessments leading to credentials, is an essential component of the career development work that New Hampshire high school students ought to be able to easily access. And finally, if I know that this bill came out of the Education Committee with bipartisan support, I ask you to join me and push the green button to pass this bill that is good for both students and businesses. Thank you. The motion before us is a Majority Committee report of order passed as amended on Senate Bill 213. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will tend to say the vote. 201 voting nay, 175 voting nay. The committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Election Law to which was referred Senate Bill 70 FN, an act relative to the establishment of an election inf informational portal. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation of the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Ross Berry from the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution. Resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Senator Claudine Burnham from the minority of the committee. Committee amendment is 1280H, printed in House Record 27, pages 36 through 27. Chair recognizes Representative Lane. Speak against, speak against the amendment. Is it a Lane to speak against the amendment? Chair recognizes Representative Barry. We don't have a debate on the amendment. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. No. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The question before us now is the majority committee report of order passed as amended on Senate Bill 70. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. No. The ayes have it. The committee report is adopted. House will be in order. Majority of the Committee on Environment and Agriculture, to which was referred Senate Bill 61, relative to surface water setbacks for landfills. Having considered the same, report the same, the following amendment, a recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Peter Bixby for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee. Having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution, resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Linda Haskins for the minority of the committee. The amendment is 1979H, printed in House Record 27, pages 34 through 36. 
This is going to be a division vote on the amendment. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is Amendment 1979H. This is a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Vervo for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know this amendment makes minimal changes to SB 61, but increases the cost to the taxpayer from $150,000 to $200,000, um, would I now, uh, would if I know that, and Mr. Speaker, if I know the uh, amendment is the increase in the amendment is for a third party contractor consultancy to advise the Department of Environmental Sciences, our services, our highly trained professionals that are adept at doing this uh, to, to help them do their work, to advise them on how to do their job. And finally, Mr. Speaker, if I know that there's another amendment, a better amendment coming after this, would I now press the red button to defeat this amendment? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Aaron for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know this committee amendment passed with bipartisan support in the Environment and Agriculture Committee, and Mr. Speaker, if I further know that this amendment makes SB 61 a much better bill by adding in RFP conflict of interest language and an extension period for new DES rules to be adopted, instead of reverting back to current rules for siting landfills. And, Mr. Speaker, if I also know that we worked hard on language that would be acceptable to DES, the folks on the other side of the wall, and other parties involved in crafting this legislation so that it can, be, that it can advance in the legislative process, would I now press the green button and vote to adopt this committee amendment? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is Committee Amendment 1979H. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to say the vote. 312 voting nay, 61 voting nay. The committee amendment is adopted. Bills on second reading open to further amendment. Senator Potenza offers floor amendment 2167. Please recognize the speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Being a new legislator, the process of getting to this point was quite disappointing. I know the Environment and Agricultural Committee has been down the setbacks for landfills road with several bills over the last few years. The most recent was HB 56 that was overwhelmingly passed by this body, 244 to 155, but was subsequently ITL'd by the other side of the wall. 
The pressure coming in to do something now feels like a fire burning that needs to be put out, not to be confused with the three solid waste facilities that were on fire over the past few weeks in New England. Let's be clear that we were told by the experts at DES that a new landfill in New Hampshire will not be needed for at least 20 years, maybe 30 or more with the food waste in composting initiatives and solutions that are finally coming to fruition in New Hampshire. Why is there such an urgency to push through a bill that is inherently flawed? That is the million dollar question for which I believe we can all conclude the answer. My amendment fixes many of the critical red flags in SB 61. Our committee witnessed incredible disrespect from unelected, unaccounted, unaccountable bureaucrats threatening vetoes if there were any changes made to SB 61. And one gentleman from the agency saying his stakeholder was the governor. The time, money, and energy to run for state representative and to subsequently be elected and serve to then watch a bill get pushed through which removes legislative oversight and authority was what brought me here. I haven't slept. I've worked on this for, for weeks. Our stakeholders are the citizens of New Hampshire that put their trust in us to make sure that unelected bureaucrats and industry gatekeepers aren't making laws that we were elected to do for the real stakeholders. That's the citizens of New Hampshire. Would we outsource the determination of a state speed limit to a private consultant? We all know the answer to that question. There's also some constitutional questions that come into play with SB 61, because the general court is not allowed to delegate their authority uh, to another body, as well as there's some taxation without representation implications as well. SB 61 is based on the false premise that there is more science to study here. There is plenty of controversy, but all of the science on this specific topic is actually settled. SB 61 outsources a fully legislative policy and that responsibility to a private consultant. This amendment changes my amendment changes so that this study gets reported back to the legislature. During our committee meeting, this amendment was introduced and received a vote bipartisan of 10 to 10. There were four absences on the committee that day, so one can assume that if this amendment would have received more support as the previous amendment did. I rise in strong support of the, the minor but critical changes my amendment makes to SB 61. Our constituents only want clean water and non-toxic living environments for themselves and their families. Many of these constituents have diligently and respectfully contacted our committee, been in attendance at committee meetings, and have considerable and diverse expertise on this subject. Why did SB 61 exclude people in the study that had other expertise than a thicker piece of plastic wrap will do the trick? Maybe ones that might show greater forethought then the new Titanic is better than the old because we wrapped the new one in plastic. This amendment puts environmental science back in the room with the industry-related engineers to execute a study which will help direct DES in the rulemaking, um, in the rulemaking for new site-specific setback rules, all with keeping a smart balance of respecting industry needs and the health and well-being of New Hampshire citizens. My amendment also helps to rule out undue technocratic bias. The language previously favored contracts that design and construction, that design and construct landfills. It is well known that such firms invariably tilt towards the conclusion that landfills are so well engineered that it doesn't matter where they are located. To counteract this bias, my amendment requires that contractors have experiences not only in landfill, landfill engineering and hydrogeology, but in also in identifying and evaluating environmental and health risks. This is critical because some contractors put so much faith in the power of technology, they fail to adequately recognize the consequences of technology failure. The best contractor will be the one that gives due consideration to the limits of landfill technology and the benefits of equitably managing environmental risks. Lastly, and most importantly, the number two reason for my amendment, 
The language in SB 61, which was not changed in the previous amendment, if the department does not adopt rules in accordance with Section 3 and 4 of this Act, within 24 months of the effective date of this Act, the department shall apply its current rules applicable to surface water protection in determining the required setback to any application for such a standard permit that is being held in abeyance when such 24-month period expires and approve it if it complies with current rules. We were told that if we changed this specific language in the bill, it would be vetoed or killed by the other body. Why would we ever pass a bill that says, we are commanding a study, the taxpayers are gonna pay for that study, whether it's 150,000 or $200,000, and we, the legislature, have no oversight once that said study is completed, but, if after the study that we the people paid for to help determine new rules, if DES doesn't adopt new rules in 24 months, we can go back to the old non-site specific rules. This is a circular firing squad statement and completely rendered the bill useless. My change was simple. If the department does not adopt rules in accordance with section three and four of this act within 24 months of the effective date of this act, the department shall hold any application for such a standard permit in abeyance until such rules are adopted. Isn't it time to put common sense back into an issue that will affect New Hampshire citizens for decades, centuries to come? Wasn't this what we were elected to do? It is time to be brave and make doing the right thing popular again. Thank you. Chair Recognizer Wendy Thomas. Hi there. I am Representative Wendy Thomas, and I ask for your support on this very important floor amendment. Sometimes it's not easy being a legislator. We have to balance so many needs, the needs of our constituents, the businesses in the state, the welfare of others, and sometimes we even have to balance what those in, other, the, in the other branches of government want. Sometimes it can be difficult but sometimes it's very easy, as it is in the case of this amendment. When we know we are making a bill stronger, when we know that people's health and welfare will benefit, and when we know that our environment will be protected, it's easy to do. In fact, it's the reason why we are up here, to make good law and to help protect others. This amendment to SB 61 simply clarifies some terms and conditions that have been left so intentionally vague that if one wanted to, one could drive a truck, maybe even a garbage truck, through them. When a bill as important as where to place a landfill that will create toxic leachate, which could lead to environmental contamination, does not consider all scientific or safety concerns which are needed to provide safety for the people who live near there and the environment, including wildlife, then it's wrong. When the bill outsources site-specific setback analysis to a currently unknown consultant instead of performing it in-house, then Houston, we have a problem. This bipartisan amendment recognizes those holes and defines vague terminology and sets guardrails in others. So what does this amendment do that the previous amendment does not? Federal environmental laws generally seek to protect public health with, quote, an ample margin of safety. But SB 61 only seeks to protect New Hampshire's waters, quote, adequately. This amendment fixes that discrepancy on page two, line 27, and puts this bill in line with federal standards. On page two, line 32, it defines the term representative with travel time and its variable across the site. This has been added because the previous phrase representative in terms of groundwater speed without more definition of the actual conditions is something that can completely be determined by the developer. 
On page three, line four, the amendment changes a shall to a may, one of our favorite changes to make. As in the department may take into account any measures proposed in the application for a permit that would provide greater or more redundant protection of perennial surface water than the department would otherwise require under its rules. This change gives DES the option to consider or to not consider a proposal or part of a proposal. Page three, line 20, lines 28 through 31 have been changed to further define the permit application proposal. And if the department relies on those measures, then the department shall require implementation of those measures as a condition to any permit. This change simply ensures that DES relies on measures and that those measures are implemented in the process. We are asking the Department of Environmental Services to walk their walk. On page four, lines six through nine, there is language that proposes a statement of any potential conflicts of interest with any entity that may benefit from any change in setback requirements, and that any preference be given to proposals that demonstrate the qualified consulting firm or individuals have credentials and experience in evaluating the health and safety risks associated with environmental protections, as well as the engineering and hydrogeological aspect of landfill design and siting. This change has been, made, uh, has been added to make sure that the health and safety risks are fully considered in all aspects. It also allows DES to consider whether the consultant has expertise in environmental protection, not only in landfill science. It makes sure that the right people are the ones who are doing the job. Page four, lines 19 through 20, the term adequate is again defined as protect perennial surface water with an ample margin of safety. Again, this change brings the bill to federal standards. Page four, lines 28 through 30, add the recommendation that soil, bedrock, proximity, demographics, or other factors that would render a particular proposal new land find site landfill site absolutely unsuitable for development. Other United States states have thriving landfill industries, despite regulations that absolutely forbid new landfills in super porous sandy soil. This amendment asks the consultant to at least consider whether similar protections might make sense for New Hampshire. All geological conditions must be considered. Page four, lines 31 through 36, continuing to page five, lines one and two, the selected contractor shall complete the assessment and submit a final report to the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and the House Environmental and Agricultural Committee, making any recommendations for legislation or rulemaking to those committees within 150 days after contract approval. This is perhaps perhaps the biggest change. The final report would not go to DES, but instead it would go to the Senate and legislature so that we could use it to make recommendations for legislation or for rulemaking. This amendment also allows for public comment. Don't you think our constituents have a thing or two to say about landfills being located near large bodies of water or near them in their communities? We know that landfills leak. We know that people can get sick from exposure to these leachates. My town is living proof of this. Without proper protections, water gets contaminated and people get sick. On page five, line 14, there is removal of the 24-month restriction after the effective date of this act. And on page five, line 24 through 25, there is a stipulation that the department shall hold any application for such a standard permit in abeyance until such rules are adopted. These changes were added because it just makes sense. Why proceed before you have definite rules? Okay, so why are all these seemingly nitpicky changes being made? It's because we can't mess around with this, folks. This bill is about where landfills which are piles and piles of potentially toxic garbage are going to be located. And we have to make sure 
that the people who are making the decision receive fair, unbiased, and scientific information on any proposed locations. We also need to make sure that the people, environment, and wildlife are fully considered in this very important decision. Look, garbage is a way of life. And until we change that, we will need landfills. However, these landfills must be placed where they can do the least harm to communities and our environment. The House already passed a perfectly good bill that would have solved this landfill siting problem. However, in the branch across the wall, they turned this into a study. Fine. If you want a study, then let's have a study. However, toxic runoff and leachate from landfills is quite frankly a danger and a threat to public and environmental safety. We must put in the proper guideline, uh, guardrails to ensure that every possible point is considered. Let's make sure that, this, that that study is well defined and well thought out and that the process is fair and complete. Let's give the Senate and the governor the study they want, but let's make sure it directs the consultants to report to us, the legislature, for our consent or modification. This amendment does that. It lets us do our job. I urge you to support this well thought out and bipartisan amendment, which puts the guardrails in place that are needed when considering where to place potentially toxic and health and environmental altering landfills in our beautiful state of New Hampshire. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Germano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise today admittedly reluctant in my support, uh, and I'll explain why my support is, is somewhat reluctance. We've heard a lot. We know a lot already about how we got to this point. We had a perfectly good bill that had specific setback rules that we passed in this House with broad bipartisan support. It was killed on the other side of the wall. We received SB 61. One of the greatest virtues, I think, one of the things that made me want to work as hard as we could to get this bill through is the importance of the abeyance, a two-year abeyance while the rule writing process took place. I tried really hard. I know that everyone on our committee did. I have great admiration and respect for our leadership on both sides of the aisle in our committee for all of the efforts that were made with all of the various stakeholders to make a bill that uh, uh, wasn't very good, quite frankly, a bad bill for the people of the state of New Hampshire better. Unfortunately, at the very last hearing that we had, there were a couple of straws that broke that camel's back, and in the end, I concluded that I could not support the bill as written, and I want to share with you just two reasons among many why, in the end, I cannot support the bill as written, and uh, I rise today in support of this amendment. Uh, they've both been referred to before, so I won't go into detail. Uh, but the first is, uh, is an important change of language, that the bill as written contains reference to adequate protections for bodies of water. We wanted to have, based on expert testimony, we wanted that language changed to language that reflects the Clean Water Act, which calls for an ample margin of safety. We were told that that was a no-go, that change of language ample margin of safety by the industry that this bill is supposed to regulate, we were told was a no-go. Likewise, the language that my colleague just referred to about representative tra travel time of groundwater, we wanted, that's, that's a pretty vague word, representative. I could drill 10 times or 50 times in a 50, fair, 50 square foot plot where I know I'm going to get the readings I want, and I can submit that as being representative of the site. We asked that wording be changed that would refer to um, variation across the site, so that you'd have to drill in lots of different places across that site and get scientific data that was genuinely representative of the site, not cherry-picked data. Again, we were told by the industry that is supposed to be regulated by this legislation that that was a no-go. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. 
We have a rule writing process that is going forward, and I sincerely hope that my colleagues, whom I admire, whom I respect, whose hard work I'm grateful for, I sincerely hope that they're right, that the oversight that this committee has the authority to do, the oversight that it is our responsibility to do during the rule writing process, I hope that we can use that oversight in order to make sure that the industry does not have the same power to influence the rule writing process that they clearly have had in the writing of legislation. Unfortunately, based on what I've seen, I have absolutely no confidence that that would happen. The hiring of a consultant to do, produce a report, we all understand how that can work. If any of you have been attending some of the public sessions about the current 306 rule writing process, that's a process which is clearly driven toward a predetermined outcome. And the result, in the end, will not be reflective of the needs and the interests of the people that we were elected to represent. So I, I understand that if we adopt this amendment, the reality is in all likelihood that it's going to be killed on the other side of the wall or it's going to be killed in the corner office. And that's why I'm really reluctant to support this. But I can no longer accept the idea that some bill, any bill, even this bill is better than no bill. So uh, I rise today to ask all of you to support this amendment to make this bill reflective of the interests and the needs of the people of the state of New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This floor amendment that is before us, while well-intentioned, will ultimately kill this much-needed bill. The amendment contains many impediments to SB 61's passage. It was not constructed with an eye to get coordinated support from the folks on the other side of the wall, or DES, or any other interested parties. And you and I know that when we do these bills, we do work together with a lot of people. That's the way it works. It comes before us today placed in your seat pockets without really being fully reviewed or vetted. And furthermore, this amendment contains language which is too restrictive to the process of establishing new DES landfill siting rules. The amendment before you seeks to make finding a suitable third party to perform a study more restrictive and will surely limit the pool of applicants. This bill amendment will also draw out this process of rulemaking for landfill siting out in a manner which is unending. This amendment has no real timetable because if the rulemaking process is not completed in two years, then any permits held in abeyance can wait indefinitely until new rules are established. This is an open-ended process that can essentially go on forever, and forever is not a good plan. The minority feels SB 61 as written and amended by the committee doesn't go far enough to ensure public safety regarding landfill siting. This is simply not true because the original bill and its committee amendment will definitely help create improvements in our current 30-year-old rules. Additionally, DES has told us that they need assistance in performing the kind of analysis required to do the technical groundwork and research to create better and more technically robust landfill siting rules. The original bill and the committee amendment already accomplishes that. This amendment before you, if passed, will certainly not be acceptable moving on to the next step. And if this bill dies, then it is guaranteed that nothing will get done this year with regard to meaningful legislation for landfill siting rule adoption. SB 61 as written and amended by the committee is a good bill on its own and will provide DES with the much needed expertise and assistance to update DES landfill siting rules. Finally, the rules for siting landfills in New Hampshire are set to expire next year. SB 61, with the amendment passed by our committee, 
will assist DES to re-examine its rules regarding landfill setbacks in an efficient and expedient manner. We must not let this chance get slipping away by adding in amending language that will ensure the death of this bill. I implore you to reject this floor amendment and pass the underlying bill and committee amendment, which is much needed and has already been vetted by many parties. Thank you so much for listening. The motion before us is the com majority committee report of water pass as amended on Senate Bill 61. The question is on the floor, the Potenza floor amendment. 2167. Who requested a division? It's in Potenza. Who requests a division? This will be a division vote. Member? Uh, jo Jonah. Representative Wheeler requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. The motion before us is floor amendment 2167. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognized Representative Haskins for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that environmental laws generally seek to protect public health with an ample margin of safety, but SB 61 only seeks to protect New Hampshire's waters adequately. Further, if I know that 61 does not require the Department of Environmental Services to even consider whether a consultant hired to do this study has expertise in environmental protection, not just landfill design, and if I know that 61 does not at least ask the consultant to consider adverse conditions for siting landfills, such as super porous soils, which other states have done, and finally, if I know that the legislature, which writes the laws to protect granite staters, should exercise oversight over the study, including the right to review, question, and comment on report. Then would I press the green button and vote for the floor amendment that provides these assurances and protections. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Megan Murray for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this floor amendment is well-intentioned and highly protective, but also creates an open-ended rule-writing process, and if I also know that many aspects of this floor amendment were summarily rejected on the other side of the wall, and if I also know that in order to prevent permits being issued under the unacceptable 200-foot setback, we need the abeyance in SB 61, as written by the committee, to be passed and signed into law, would I vote no or red on this floor amendment? Thank you. The motion before us is floor amendment 2167. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Represent Wary, represent Missouri, I need your votes.
Representative Gallagher. Representative Hungren. Representative Abear. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay the vote. 152 voting nay, 226 voting nay. The floor amendment fails. We're now on to ought to pass as amended. The chair recognizes the representative Verville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sorry for being a little tardy. Colleagues, I am going to strongly encourage you to vote no on this bill. So this bill is calling for a third-party consultancy to advise the Department of Environmental Services on rulemaking for landfill siting. DES is our highly trained professionals that we hire and trust to do this work. They are doing this work. So what's the problem with getting a little help from a consultancy other than blowing $200,000? The pro-industry side is afraid that the consultancy is going to be the greenies and that we're going to wreak havoc and just put landfills wherever we want willy-nilly in New Hampshire. The Greenies, and I don't mean that in a bad way, because I have a, I have a green, green streak through me for sure. But if the Greenies control it, the rules are going to be written so that it'll be virtually impossible to site a landfill anywhere in New Hampshire. And we hear people bemoan we're importing trash from out of state. And it's a travesty against New Hampshire. So let me ask you a question. Sorry, let me ask you a question, Mr. Speaker. Where does our hazmat go? Where does our hazardous material go? It doesn't go into landfills. It doesn't go into hazmat mitigation facilities in New Hampshire. Do you know why? Because we don't have one. To the best of my knowledge, most of it goes to Ohio, where they have a high temperature incinerator to dispose of such material. Imagine if Ohio decided we're not going to take New Hampshire's hazmat anymore. That would be a problem. A serious problem, not to mention it's interstate commerce, which is beyond the purview of our control. If we can't cite landfills, then we export all of our rubbish to some poor other state. And that's not fair either. It's my opinion that our current citing rules are adequate and sufficient. This is all carryover from the Dalton landfill, Casella landfill hangover of a couple of years ago. That project has been recalled, right? It's, that, that is no longer on the table. This, this bill is going to bite somebody where they don't want to be bitten. And the best part of it is it's like rolling the dice. We don't know who it's going to bite until after we pass it. And somebody else beyond our control hires the consultancy that's going to drive that bus. Is there a stopgap? Sure, there's a stopgap. Gel car. Those rules, will, I assume, go to gel car. So is, is that where we want to have this fight again? Or do we take a more rational, reasonable, metered approach and entrust the Department of Environmental Services 
to do that which they have been tasked with. And it's interesting because as far as I know, and maybe somebody can bring testimony to the contrary, but the De Department of Environmental Sciences is not asking, and services is not asking for this. They, they're not asking for 200000 to hire a consultant. They're quite confident they can do their job without uh, interference from, from the outside world. And I say, God bless them. Let's, let's let them do the job that we've hired them to do. Let us trust our highly trained professional administrative staff to do their job. So if you vote green, you're rolling the dice, or flipping a coin, I guess. And so good luck to you. Me? I'm voting red. It, this bill has opposition from, from every angle Right? When, when every, everybody at the table has a problem with a bill, that's not the bill to pass. Right? So I, I encourage you to listen to the rest of the debate. Please consider what, what I've told you. Uh, and when the time comes, vote red. Vote red and kill this bill. Thank you. Chair recognized Representative Bixby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> SB 61 deals with the rules for setbacks between new landfills and surface water bodies. <clears throat> we tried to provide highly protective guidance for the Department of Environmental Services with HB 56, which was ITL'd on the other side of the wall. SB 61 is the other body's approach to setback rules, and our committee has amended it with a few improvements. As it came to us, SB 61 gave DES two years to make specific setback rules based on site hydrology and technical measures that, incre that increase protection. <clears throat> and at the request of DES, who said they would not be able to do this uh, in the one year that the, that the other body was originally thinking of, but required two years, and that they would not be able to do this without additional manpower in the form of a consultant, which is a short-term fix rather than hiring new personnel forever. Uh, <clears throat> the the D DES requested money for the recall consultant uh, in order to make sure that they would be able to provide to finish these rules in a timely manner. <clears throat> so another, another very important aspect of SB 61 as it came to us is that all, whole, all permits are held in abeyance until the rules are in place, as long as it happens within two years. <clears throat> Our amendment adds explicit language uh, re that requires disclosure of conflict of interest, provides a small increase in funding to make sure that the RFP attracts a good selection of well-qualified consultants, and allows for a 90-day extension of the abeyance in case of in extraordinary circumstances that might prevent the department from completing the rules in, within two years. If SB 69, 61 does not pass, new landfill permits, <coughs> new landfill permit applications can be filed almost immediately and will be assessed under the current completely unacceptable 200-foot setback. <clears throat> the committee amendment was negotiated to strengthen the bill as much as possible without inviting a vote of non-concurrence on the other side of the wall. We, want to make sh <clears throat> we wanted to make the bill more protective, but we were assured that more stringent language would in fact cause the bill to fail. SB 61, as amended, creates a clear process for better rules, and most critically, it stops all permit approvals within the next two years. Please vote yes on OTP to protect our New Hampshire waters. Thank you. The motion before us in the majority committee report of order pass as amended on Senate Bill 61. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. No. Division has been requested. Hold the door. Hold the door. Nobody in. Nobody out. Nobody in that wasn't here.
The motion before us is a majority committee report of water passes amended in Senate Bill 61. This is a division vote. The chair was unsure of the yelling. <laughs> if you're in favor, you'll press the red button. I mean the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay the vote. 236 voting yay, 132 voting nay. The committee report is adopted. For what reason does the member rise? Mr. Speaker, I would move that we remove SB 149 regarding nurses' agencies from the table and I would request a division vote. That is a proper motion. Senator Weber moves that Senate Bill 149 be removed from the table. Roll call, Mr. Speaker. Sweeney Representative Sweeney has requested the roll call. Will Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. The motion before us is to remove Senate Bill 149 from the table. This is, this, this, yeah. this is going to be a roll call vote. Chair recognized Representative Moulton for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that I spoke against this bill several weeks ago, and if I discovered later that I had misunderstood the effect of the bill, and if I want to have an opportunity to support this bill, and if I know this would help our county nursing homes, would I now press the green button to remove this bill from the table? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Carol McGuire for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this bill is well-intentioned in trying to deal with bad behavior on the part of nursing agencies, but is totally useless, and if I know that the registration it requires is only a hassle, it will not prevent any of the abuses that the proponents of this bill are, are in favor of. They will still have to deal with it. If I know that the problem it's trying to solve is dealt with is the national shortage of nurses while we have high demand all over the country, and therefore, if New Hampshire decides to hassle the nursing agencies, they'll simply send their nurses to Massachusetts or Maine or Vermont or wherever it, they can do it more easily. And if I know that despite the massive power of the New Hampshire General Court, we cannot repeal the law of supply and demand, 
would I now vote red to leave this, this bill on the table? The motion before us is to remove Senate Bill 149 from the table. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Well, members present, had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 190 voting yay, 188 voting nay. The motion passes. Senate, Senate Bill 149 is removed from the table. For what reason does the member rise? Mr. Speaker, I'd like to make a motion to print the marks from SB 61 in the journal. It's, it's not order. We haven't finished the debate yet. The motion before us now is ought to pass as amended on Senate Bill 149. Chair recognize. Chair, recognize Representative Grassi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First thing I'd like to point out that I am not a nurse. But what I am is, I'm a member of the county delegation in Stratford County. And I'm a member of a county delegation as you all are. One of our responsibilities as a member of the county delegation is oversight of our nursing homes. And as part of the oversight of our nursing homes, it's the quality of care that our patients get that are in those nursing homes. I had an opportunity to speak to my nursing home administrator, and I want to tell you that all 10 nursing home administrators in the 10 counties in New Hampshire support this bill. So when we say it may not be needed, but they, all 10 of them support it. New Hampshire Association of Counties sent you a, a notice the other day saying they support this bill as well. What we have to worry about, what a nursing home administrator has to worry about when a nurse is planning to be out sick from maternity or sick, an injury or whatever, when they're short of short staff, they have to depend on these nursing agencies. And these are, they enter into contracts with these nursing agencies to provide replacements so that our patients can receive quality care. The residents of our homes receive quality care. This bill does three things. It requires that the medical staffing agencies do business in New Hampshire be registered with the state with the Office of Professional Licenses and Certif Certification. It prohibits agencies from double booking staff at multiple facilities simultaneously and then engaging in a bidding war between facilities at the 11th hour and re rewarding the highest bidder and prohibits agencies of recruiting on a provider's premises. Sounds a little unethical, but when I spoke to particularly the part where it talks about the double booking, I talked to my administrator and he said, you know, when I get a call from an agency, we've entered into a contract and I get a call from an agency and they said, you know, that nurse case is gonna show up this week because we got a better rate from another, an, another, another place, another hospital or another nursing home he says, that sounds like extortion. They want me to pay more than I agreed to. 
Most of our budgets are set by us at the counties, and so they don't have the ability to go out and just raise their rates and, and, and charge more money and dip into the budget, just get more money. They have to come back to the delegations if they need more money. This, so this is creating problems for them. And you know, he called it extortion, and that's exactly what it is. It's extortion. And I think when you, if you take a look at it from what is our responsibility to those folks, our mothers, our fathers, our relatives, our parents, our grandparents, who are in these homes, that we have to be concerned about the quality of care. And when we're taking a look at the issues that we have with staffing and retention right now in nursing homes, this is an important bill, and this is something that is valuable for us, and we should, we should pass this bill today. So if I want to support our nursing homes, support, our nursing, support the patients who are in our nursing homes, and support our administrators who work hard to give the best quality that we can in our nursing homes, would I not now vote green? And let's get this thing approved. Thank you. I heard a request for a roll call. Representative Cushman requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is Senate Bill 149 ought to pass as amended. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative McGuire, Carol McGuire, for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this bill merely requires registration of nurse agencies, and if I know that the Office of Professional Licensure has almost no control and no means to discipline agencies that are, do not obey the rules or the laws other than to unregister them. And if I know that that will be ineffectual in solving the problems that our nursing homes, both county and otherwise, are facing. And again, if I know we can't repeal the law of supply and demand to get more nurses, and this bill will do nothing to solve that problem, would I press the red button? Chair, recognize Representative Weber for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the flight of agencies and nurses to other states is unlikely because they already have this kind of registration in place, and this just levels the playing field, and if I want to give an even chance, especially to our county nursing homes, but to all of our institutions, would I now press the green button to pass this bill? Motion before us is ought to pass as amended on Senate Bill 149. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Perez. 
For all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the roll. 191 voting nay, 187 voting nay. Senate Bill 141 passes. For what reason does a member rise? Mr. Speaker, I would like to make a motion. State your motion. To, I would like to um, move to put the remarks of SB 61 in the journal. Without objection, sold. Committee on Finance, to which was referred Senate Bill 172 FN an act allowing court-appointed guardians to receive temporary assistance to needed family benefits. Consider the same, report the same with the recommendation the bill ought to pass. Jess Edwards for the committee. Bill is on second reading, open to further amendment. Representative Lynn offers floor amendment 2116H. And is Representative Lynn is recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, I rise in support of this amendment. This amendment adds uh, to SB 172 the verbatim text of House Bill 117 as passed by this body on March 9th of this year with a strong bipartisan vote. The vote, in fact, on a roll call was 211 to 157. Please recall that the purpose of, of House Bill 117 was to overrule a 2005 Supreme Court decision that essentially makes the term of a lease, that is the length of a lease, unenforceable if you are a landlord. So that, for example, a one-year lease means it's a one-year lease for the tenant, but not for the landlord. If at the end of the term the landlord wishes to terminate the lease, that does not provide a basis to evict the tenant because, according to that Supreme Court decision, the end of the contract is not good cause for an eviction. Bear in mind that the rule, of, uh, as established by that Supreme Court decision, applies not just to big landlords, but to small landlords who rent out as few as two rental units if they are not single-family homes and if they are not owner-occupied. The court decision was criticized by Justice Joseph Neto, an appointee of Governor Shaheen, in a special concurrence. He wrote that the effect of the Supreme Court's ruling was to render lease terms a nullity and to grant tenants a perpetual lease where, that was, where there was no evidence that that was what the legislature intended. HB 117 uh, and this amendment corrects the court's error by saying that the end of a tenancy is a proper basis to evict a tenant, but the, tenant, but, uh, the landlord must give 30 days notice and there is an exception for very short-term leases. Although this, house overwhelm, or the, although this House, by a substantial vote, passed this bill, it was ITL'd in the Senate. Um, it was ITL'd on a voice vote and although we don't have a, a record, people who were in the gallery and supported the bill indicate that it appeared, they're not, they're not contesting that, that uh, it, it was in fact ITL, but they do indicate that it was a close vote. Um, passage of this amendment will help to make housing available to marginalized people. As I said at the time the bill was before the Senate, uh, before this body before, a landlord is more likely to take a risk on a person who might be a, might be a sort of a marginalized or a, a questionable tenant, maybe with a spotty credit record or whatever, if the landlord knows that if the landlord pr proposes a one-year lease, it really means it's one year, not that the landlord is on the hook forever. If the landlord, under, as under current law, knows that I may be on the hook forever, then it's much less likely that the landlord would be open to considering a marginalized tenant. <clears throat> 
We, we in this body agreed with that analysis, but the Senate did not. By attaching this amendment to SB, 150, uh, SB 172, a non-controversial bill that both chambers support, the other chamber will have to reevaluate its position and likely will see the wisdom of the House's efforts to enhance housing availability. So if you voted for this bill before, I respectfully ask that you do so again now by supporting this amendment. And if you didn't vote for House Bill 117 before, I respectfully request that you rethink your position and hopefully change your view. The current state of New Hampshire law on this issue, I submit respectfully, really is an embarrassment and cries out to be fixed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I ask for a division vote. Chair recognizes Cam Kenney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so I urge my colleagues to vote against this floor amendment. Uh, this amendment would essentially make it easier to evict a tenant without any legitimate reasoning. Um, so let's start by just briefly going over um, the good cause statute. Currently, landlords who lease restricted property must have good cause for eviction. This is a fair and balanced law that has been in effect since 1985. Um, good cause offers landlords a number of reasons, including business and economic reasons, to justify a conviction. This includes when a tenant doesn't increase to a rent increase, wanting to renovate or take the unit off the market, or wanting to rent it to a family member. Also, without this amendment, landlords can already evict for non-payment of rent, uh, damaging the property, or really any violation of the lease. So in short, this amendment will not in any way help marginalized people. This amendment would significantly weaken the good cause eviction st statute when there are a number of legitimate reasons that a landlord can evict a tenant without this amendment. As the Supreme Court held in 2005, arbitrarily evicting someone at the end of a lease term is not good cause. Ending this law that has offered protection from arbitrary loss of housing for 40 years during a time when there is a housing crisis will expose thousands of Granite Staters to great harm. Therefore, I respectfully ask my colleagues to press the red button and kill this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is the floor amendment 2116H. A division has been requested. Members will take your seats. The motion before us is the f Lynn. House will be in order. Is the Lynn Floor Amendment 2116. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Lynn for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this amendment restores the fundamental principle of law that contact contracts are supposed to mean what they say, and if I also know that passing this amendment will help to improve the availability of rental housing to marginalized individuals 
by giving landlords reason to take a chance on renting to such persons. And finally, if I know that adding this amendment to SB 172, a non-controversial bill that will pass this chamber, whether or not uh, this amendment is adopted, uh, but passing this amendment will likely cause the other chamber behind the wall to rethink its erroneous position uh, on this issue, then would I support the passage of this amendment by, passing, uh, by pushing the green button? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Magli Ori for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as someone who voted incorrectly when this bill came up the first time and has learned the error of his ways, um, and Mr. Speaker, um, if I know that current New Hampshire law provides that landlords do not have to put up with and can evict tenants who don't pay their rent, destroy property, who have pets when they are not supposed to, or who are disruptive to other tenants, and Mr. Speaker, if I know that the New Hampshire law gives the landlord the right to require a rental application from the prospective tenants, allows landlords to charge an application fee for the time and effort they take to review the application, and calls tenants past landlords or personal recommendations now without this amendment, and if I know that landlords that live in buildings where they rent or landlords that rent commercial, seasonal, recreational, or single-family homes can initiate the eviction process or cancellation of a lease at any time without good cause without this amendment, then, Mr. Speaker, would I now push the red button so that another motion can be made? Thank you. The motion before us is the Lynn Floor Amendment 2116H. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you oppose, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will attend to stay to the vote. 185 voting yay, 188 voting nay. The floor amendment fails. Senator Edwards did not vote, declaring a conflict. We're back now to auto pass as amended. Auto pass. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Committee report is adopted. We have some announcements. The chair recognizes Representative Alexander. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Everyone should have received um, Save the Day from New Hampshire Realtors. If you did not notice the big tent outside, there is free lunch for all state reps. So join me on the lawn. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative De Simone for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to all of my colleagues, there uh, will be a meeting of the owls. Thank you. In the Webster room, bring your lunch uh, and enjoy the lively conversation that we'll have. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Wilhelm for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Democrats House, will caucus. Representative will say the House will be in order. Democrats will caucus downstairs in the cafeteria at one o'clock sharp. Don't be late. Thanks. Chair recognizes Representative Osborne. Republicans, uh, we will caucus right now in the hall and uh, go get lunch afterward. The House, the House will be in recess. For a, until 
Mr. Speaker, the Senate concurs with the House of Representatives in the passage of the following entitled bill with amendment, in the passage of which amendment the Senate asks the concurrence of the House. House Bill 1A, making appropriations for the expenses of certain departments of the state for fiscal years ending June 30, 2024 and June 30, 2025. Representative Weiler moves we concur, and the chair recognizes Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 1 is the product of bipartisan and bicameral negotiations that have taken place over the course of this entire legislative session. This budget package is balanced, cuts taxes, and our expanding economy further increases state revenues without increasing a single tax or fee. House Bill 1 is the numbers document, and we can build on the historic precedent that the voice vote in April set for us by concurring with the other body on House Bill 1 today. Thank you. Representative Harrington requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It's not sufficiently seconded. The motion before us is House Bill 1, to concur on House Bill 1. Are you ready for the question? Division has been requested. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats. motion before us is concurrence on House Bill 1. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present have the opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 351 voting nay, 25 voting nay. House Bill 1 is accepted. Recognize the clerk. Mr. Speaker, the Senate concurs with the House on the passage of the following entitled bill with amendments and the passage of which amendments the Senate asks to concur into the House. House Bill 2, FNA Local, relative to state fees, funds, revenues, and expenditures. Representative Weiler moves we concur. The chair recognizes Representative Pearson, Stephen Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, honorable colleagues. If you'd asked me a month ago if I would ever have had to speak on House Bill 2, I would have said no. I don't want to be here. But I have to be here. I have to be here for two reasons. One, for the record, Representative Steve Pearson, Rockingham District 13, Derry, member of the pension system, member of a lot of things, <laughs> really. The first reason I rise in opposition to this is because I have to, in the effect of 
the educational formula. My school district is the third largest school district in the state of New Hampshire. The numbers that are there, I, I can't even fathom why dairy was grossly neglected in that calculation. The second reason I rise in opposition to House Bill 2 is in reference to a substantial effort made by this body this year to right a wrong. And I want to just address some grossly inaccurate statements that have been made lately. I think this is important to set the record straight. The pension restoration part that we voted on, 282 to 80, which is way past veto proof, has been referred to as a sweetener bill by the executive branch. That's far from reality. It restored some of the items, just some, that were retroactively taken away from our first responders. It provided no new benefit of any kind. Returning something that was stolen from you is never sweetening anything. Then we had to deal with a lobbying group that created a false fiscal analysis. Pension-related items are processed by the retirement system. That is their function. And the costs associated with legislation are processed by a consulting firm, an actuarial firm that the state has used for 20 years. But this lobbying group decided to create their own. They included irrelevant items in their analysis. They included items that occurred in past legislative sessions. I've never seen, I've been here three terms, I've never seen that tactic before. And they've inclu they included items that were already bought and paid for. And then they claimed it was the true analysis. And at one point, there were folks getting this analysis attached to the one from the retirement system. It kind of made it look like it went together. This lobbying group doesn't have an actuary on their staff. They're not qualified to do this analysis. And yet that's what they presented to the Senate. Thirdly, there have been repeated inaccurate statements that this bill reintroduces spiking back into the pension system. Spiking is when an employee has the ability to manipulate their work schedules and conditions to overly inflate their pension, something I abhor. And all of the folks in this room that deal with the pension system have no tolerance for. All of the anti-spiking provisions that were enacted from 2007 to 2011 remain in law. In fact, the anti-spiking provisions were expanded. They were expanded by extending the pension cap back from 2009 to 2001. A hard pension cap is the ultimate anti-spiking provision. The stakeholders agreed for the first time in a decade they agreed with each other. That was a monumental task in and of itself. But they agreed to dozens of concessions. Finance Division I unanimously voted on this. When this bill, House Bill 436, came before this body, the fiscal note on it was $258 million to be paid over 10 years. Through substantial work, we got that cost down to 100. We voted in a veto-proof majority at $258 million. We found that acceptable in this body. Since then, we've dropped it to 100. With a reduction in pension debt on top of funding this. Thanks to the efforts of Representative Joe Sweeney, we found dedicated funding source for this, to pay for this without having to use any general fund appropriation. We made this fix easy. This body in, the, in 2011 did something that no other state had done. It retroactively modified our pension system for our first responders, despite Article 23 of our state constitution. Every single state dealt with pension problems between 07 and 
2012 in the District of Columbia. Nobody else retroactively hurt their people, just us. That should tell you something. This leaves New Hampshire alone, still in this. We continue to stick our heads in the sand and ignore the massive problem we have in emergency services with hiring and retaining people. We just saw, for those of you out west, Keene, the closing of a much needed ambulance service out there. Prior to 2011, New Hampshire was competitive in the New England regional labor market. Today, we're dead last. Why did this happen? What was the real reason? It is claimed that it was to make up a $900 million budget shortfall. OK. If that's true, then in an era of three budget cycles with substantial surpluses, why could we not restore that which was cut? Or maybe that wasn't the reason at all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to make a motion. I'd like to move to table this bill. It is a proper motion. And I'd like to speak to my motion. It's not debatable. I thought you could speak as to why you want a table. You can only do a PI. Okay, well, I'll do a PI on why I want a table. It is a proper motion. The motion before us is to table House Bill 2. Mr. Speaker, not, if I. Not, oh, excuse me. Yes. not yet. Are you ready for the question? Division has been requested. Division. Division. Yes, sir. The motion before us is to table House Bill 2. This is a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Harrington for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this bill has 208 separate parts and that practically nobody has read them all and almost nobody understands them, Mr. Speaker, if I know this is supposed to be Concord and not Washington, where we actually read bills before we vote for them, would I now push the green button to table this bill so it will be brought back at a later time after people actually understand what they're voting on? Chair, recognize Representative Stephen Smith for a parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, if I know a lot of the people that have a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this budget, and that at this time, we should hear any debate that comes up and deal with it now because deal with it at a later time? There is no later time. This is a motion on whether to concur or not than what I press the red button. The motion before us is to table House Bill 2. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you oppose, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
Representative Perez. Man. Representative Perez. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, the House will attend the state of the vote. 44 voting nay, 334 voting nay. The motion fails. Chair recognizes Representative Dan McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a different perspective on the pension aspects um, that are not currently in House Bill 2, but were in House Bill 2 when it left this body uh, months ago. Um, first of all, let's start with a little bit of history. A year ago, um, we passed uh, a bill that improved the pensions of the group in question, the group of Group 2 firefighters hired from one date to another, but roughly a 10 or so year period. Um, and the cost of that bill was a little over $40 million. The bill is originally, this was House Bill 1578, I think, um, from a year ago. And, and the bill was originally maybe $56 million. It came to the House Finance Committee. It was reduced to $40, $42 million. It went over to the other side, passed unanimously, signed into law by the governor. So already in the current biennium, the biennium we're in right now, we have improved pensions for this exact same group of people by 40-something million dollars. This year, a bill was proposed, House Bill 436, which was a significant additional improvement and, and restoration, I'll, that, that's correct. Um, for that same group, and um, it would have been, you know, the original fiscal note was roughly $250 million spread out over 10 years, $25 million a year for 10 years. Now, I would disagree with my friend from Derry on the, on the aspect of spiking, because this, that bill, House Bill 436, changed the definitions of income and the definitions of average final compensation, as well as some other uh, features, the, the multiplier and the age at which retirement could be, someone could retire and so on. But this, in specific, the definitions of what is income, that is where spiking occurs. So for example, if someone is allowed to take uh, sick days as a large lump sum, at the end, just before retirement, then the, and have that count as though they had a large salary that last year, that significantly affects retirement. And the, the definitions that is currently in place for that group, and in fact, it's in place for every employee, not just group two, but it's in place for group ones as well, does not allow that kind of spiking. All right. This bill, House Bill 436, changed those definitions back to the previous set of definitions that were in place when this particular group was hired but not yet vested. And so um, during when the bill came to our committee, to Finance Division 1, um, I suggested, why don't we take out those definition changes and, and, and consider just the other changes, the, the multiplier, the age, and so on, all right, separately, okay? Because the definition changes is something that applies to everyone. Group one, you know, we're talking about teachers, state employees, everybody, all right? It was not something done special for group two, all right? The other parts were, but this part was not. And I'm told by the retirement system that doing that alone, just leaving the definitions the way they are, changes the 250 million to something more like 75 million. Okay, so so this to what I think of as the spiking aspects are a significant part of this bill. Okay, 
Now, let's talk about what happened to the bill once it left us. All right? I've had extensive discussions with the chair of the other uh, finance committee. He's someone I know quite well because we sat next to each other in Division Four for two years. And the, the problem is, as we sent it, the $250 million, it was simply sticker shock, right? They passed the $40 million a year earlier, no problem at all, 24 to nothing, you know, everybody liked it, right? But, but jumping on, you know, trying to ask, it was too big of an ask. And the problem, and so you might say, well, why didn't they cut it down to something and then we could have committee of conference and we could, we could negotiate. The, the problem is, you, it, in order to negotiate, maybe if you're trying to sell your car for 25,000 and the buyer wants to pay 20,000, you can negotiate, all right? But when one side wants 250 million and the other side might be willing to do 50 million or something, there's no negotiation position, right? You're too far apart. All right. And so what they, what they did in the budget that we're voting on right now is they took this out and unfortunately, um, I'm very disappointed, they also took out House Bill 50 which was the pay down of the pension system, uh, pension unfunded liability that we all voted for, or many of us did. And um, that kind of got lost in the, in the shuffle. And, um, and they put in a commission, a very you know, high level sort of commission, to think about improving the pension system for everyone, not just this particular group of group two employees, you know, hired from one year to, to, to another, but all group two employees. Because this particular group already has a pension better than the ones that are younger than them. So they already have a pension that's, that's superior to the ones that we're hiring today. And so if our concern is hiring and retention, Maybe we ought to think about the younger ones as well, right? And that's what this commission is for. So I think they're serious about doing something, but, but they, it was too big of an ask. You know, they, we asked for the stars, and they might have been willing to give us a piece of the moon or something like that, you know? So it was too big of an ask, and this is their way of saying to us, sorry, we need more time, we, we need a different structure, you know, it, it's not gonna work this way. And not only, by the way, did they take out the pension stuff, but they took the state's wallet and locked it away. <laughs> they, they left all of our spare change in the Education Trust Fund, so, where it can't be used <laughs> uh, for this kind of thing. So, so they really are sending us a serious message that they don't want what we tried to do, okay? But I, I think it is not over, right? And one thing I've learned being here a few terms, nothing is ever over, right? We're always talking, we're always working. And so not only do we have the commission, but we still own House Bill 436. So we have retained it, it'll come out, and so on. And I don't think, you know, it's not like the other body is somehow opposed to group two employees, right? I mean, that's, that's just silly. But it, we asked for too much. That's, that's the bottom line. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognize Representative Prout. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill includes several sections that together drastically expand the mission and potentially number of police officers in New Hampshire. We've already debated these sections back in April, and this House voted overwhelmingly to remove them. This would be enough for me to ask you to press the red button on this motion and uh, the motion to accept the changes made by the, other, the body on the other side of the wall. However, there's also the fact that this bill was passed in the other body less than 24 hours ago with several substantive floor amendments. I haven't had the chance to fully study it, 
have you? We've all heard the quote, you need to pass the bill to find out what's in it. That's not the New Hampshire way. We're not up against a House deadline for this motion. It's being rushed unnecessarily. Please press the red button to say no to this dangerous fast track so another motion can be made to send this bill to a committee conference. In other words, the normal process for a budget bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognize Representative Waller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to urge the members of the House to vote to concur with House Bill 2 as amended by the Senate. The House sent the Senate a budget that House Democrats and Republicans came together on. Remember that historic vote when we passed the House budget on a voice vote? By working together, we were able to provide a desperately needed rate increase for our Medicaid providers. And the Senate recognized the importance of our work and included the House level of funding in their budget. The important pay raise for our valuable state employees remains unchanged from the House budget. In areas of housing, the Senate added an additional $5 million to the House budget and by rearranging the appropriations, they applied $10 million for homeless support for our cities and towns. The Senate education funding formula is similar to the House formula, spending slightly more than the House, but both plans increase school funding to our communities over the cur current level of funding. Senate budget includes 20 million additional dollars for municipal bridges, and apportionment funds that our communities need to keep our bridges safe. And $2 million was added to bolster our vital PFAST remediation program. The Senate, Senate built on the important work that the House had done by adding needed funding in several areas, child care, family resource centers, CTEs, and mental health just to name a few. The Senate was able to use 2023 surplus funds to provide much of the additional funding for these vital services. But still, they were able to deposit close to 63 million in the rainy day fund at the end of the biennium. Like all budgets, we do not get everything we want. But this budget goes a long way to meeting the needs of New Hampshire citizens and communities. We can all name something we wish was not in this budget. And we can all name something that we wish was in this budget, but it did not make it. Coming to a compromise is what happens when we listen to each other and come to agreement. It does not mean we give up on our budget concerns. No, it means we keep working on the areas where we could not reach agreement and over the next several months, we will continue to work on some areas where agreement was not reached. This session, we have learned an important lesson about working together. The legislation we pass is much stronger when we work together, Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate. This budget is an example of policymakers putting forth their best efforts. I urge you to support the concur motion on the House budget on House Bill 2 as amended by the Senate. Chair recognize Representative Sanborn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of concurring on House Bill 2. Building a state budget isn't easy, especially when you have to craft it to meet the diverse needs of the people of New Hampshire and pass muster with a majority of 424 members of the House and Senate. No state budget that I've ever seen is perfect, but we can never let perfect be the enemy of good. Personally, I would have liked to see some of the pension reform efforts that the House passed for our police and fire. But I fully recognize that compromise is how we get things done, and I look forward to continuing the conversation on pension reform moving forward. So let me highlight some of the good things in this budget that we can all be proud of. 
over $200 million in mills and rooms tax distributions to municipalities, over $70 million in highway block grants to municipalities, $6 million for municipal bridge aid grants, $160 million increase for Medicaid provider rates, investments in affordable housing and homelessness services, investments in mental health, system of care for the elderly, and child care. Competitive pay increases within state government to help us compete in this tough labor market and continue to provide services for our citizens. Emergency power reforms. Accelerated phase out of the interest and dividends tax. Reauthorization of Medicaid expansion with a seven year sunset to give the legislature authority to reevaluate it. And most importantly, record investment in education over $2 billion over the biennium, where no municipality gets less money and aid is targeted to the towns with the greatest need. We can nitpick this for hours, but let's face it, the Senate based their budget based on the hard work of the House budget, and the majority of what is in the Senate is what we can all be supportive of, something that both parties can promote as a win for the state of New Hampshire. This is not the end of the process, and we will continue through this year and next year to find solutions to our state's problems, big and small. But join me now in this historic vote to concur with our colleagues and move forward with a budget New Hampshire needs now. Thank you. The motion before us is to occur on House Bill 2. I, Representative Hines requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is to occur on House Bill 2. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes the Representative Harrington for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that there actually are cuts to education aid to many, many towns in this bill because inflation is running way over 10 percent over the two year period, and most towns are getting way less than that. If I also know that, again, there's 208 different changes in this bill to, to the state budget, the implementation of, and I know that nobody has read all of them and certainly nobody understands them all. So I urge people to wait until you've actually read the bill. It may be a great bill, but we don't know that now. So please push the red button. Chair, recognize Representative Stephen Smith for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that in my seven terms I have never, not once, voted for a budget I was completely happy with, because I don't get everything I want. But Mr. Speaker, if I'm gonna do today what I did then, and vote for the budget that reflects the opinions of a few hundred people because it's our job, then would I press the green button? Motion before us is to concur on House Bill 2. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. Three hundred twenty six voting nay, fifty three voting nay. House Bill two is adopted. I believe we kind of just made history when we passed a budget on a voice vote and we just passed a buy in a bipartisan budget with probably the highest numbers we've ever seen. This chamber deserves some congratulations. For what reason does the member rise? To make a motion. State your motion. I move that the remarks of the speaker um, be placed into the permanent journal. <laughs> kind, of, kind of strange for me to say without objection, but I guess I will. Without objection. <laughs> Committee on Finance, to which was referred Senate Bill 204 FN, an act requiring trauma kits to be available in state-owned buildings. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment and a recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Instead of Dan McGuire for the committee. The amendment is 2080H, printed in House Record 27, pages 48 through 49. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. So, the bill is The Committee on Labor, Industrial, and Rehabilitative Services to which was referred Senate Bill 42FN relative to overpayment of unemployment compensation comes without recommendation. Representative Seaworth offers amendment. Representative Seaworth moves auto pass and offers amendment 1799. Printed in House Record 27, page 25, and is authorized to speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to ask your support on this amendment. Um, this amendment accomplishes uh, all the goals of the original bill, but does it without some of the unintended consequences. So the question is, what are those goals of the original bill? And that does get a little complicated. As explained to the committee, the purpose of submitting uh, SB 42 was to address a situation that came up during the COVID pandemic. As I think we all know, the uh, unemployment system came under some strain then with more people applying for unemployment benefits, more people receiving them, the rules changing on who is eligible for, for benefits, and federal money coming in um, to make up some of that difference in funding. Um, it got very complicated and it was confusing. Now, just one of these complications involves what happens in the case uh, that departments of labor call overpayment. More specifically, what happens when someone applies for unemployment um, but misrepresents their situation and then receives money for which they are not eligible? The simple answer is they have to pay it back. Uh, but there's a difference between state and federal law. Under state law, 
any money that's not paid back to the trust fund within a timely fashion will accumulate interest. In federal law, that doesn't occur. And so this bill as amended will address that situation and it will do it through the department's rulemaking process. Now that probably sounds even more complicated, but I think it's a lot simpler than it sounds because the existing department rules already deal with this. What happens um, when there are differing individual situations and, and when you play, pay interest. Um, you'll probably hear from some of the other speakers about some of those conditions where people really shouldn't be paying interest when they're already down, when they're already out of work. Uh, but there's a lot of gray area between you got money that was no fault of your own and you got money by committing a felony and you're going to jail. And through the rulemaking process, we can address that continuum. Just to give an example, under the current rules, whether you pay interest or not is not a given. An obvious exception is, let's say, I receive money for which I was not eligible, but it was through no fault of my own. In that case, I get to keep the money, and obviously, I don't pay any interest on it. But what if it was my fault? If, I, if that money that I wasn't supposed to receive, that isn't mine, if I can give that back to the state within the time limit, then I also don't pay interest. If I can't, and I go to the state and I work out a payment plan, then that interest will be waived at the end of it when I've paid off the original amount. And if my financial situation is such that I simply can't afford to pay the money back, the rules in place already allow for giving that debt. So this amendment, despite its length, really is simple extending that process to the interest so that it won't be charged up front rather than being waived at the, at the end. Now it is true that there are other states, many states, that don't charge interest at all. But if you look at it, many of those states have other ways to chase down, to claw back this money that is owed by people who shouldn't have gotten in the first place. In New Hampshire, this is it. If someone doesn't pay back money that they shouldn't have received, our only way to motivate them to pay it back is that if they don't pay it in a timely fashion, then interest begins to accrue. We have the underlying bill, the amended bill, we're both going for the same goal. I'm just asking you uh, to support me. I believe, as amended, that um, this is a better path to getting to where we want to be. So I ask you, please support the motion, plus press the green button. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Brian Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to Amendment Number 1799H. In the words of the sponsor of SB 42, this amendment effectively guts the bill. The intent of the bill, as we received it from the other body, is to prevent the Department of Employment Security from charging interest on overpayments of benefits except in instances, and this is a quote, where the recipient willfully makes a false statement or representation or knowingly fails to disclose a material fact to obtain or increase unemployment compensation. The process of obtaining unemployment compensation involves filing with the department on a weekly basis to provide assurance that the recipient is doing everything necessary to remain qualified and by um, providing earnings information to establish the amount of comp compensation that is due. It is not difficult to make a mistake in one or more of these weekly applications. I suggest that no interest should be charged on the overpayment when the overpayment is due to an honest mistake. It should indeed be repaid, but without the accrual of interest. 
This amendment allows the department to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether to charge interest or not. The department has assured us it will write rules to determine when it would exercise this, this discretion that this amendment provides. I suggest, rather than writing rules on its discretion, the department might instead write rules to define when a fraudulent claim has occurred. This would honor the intent of the bill and treat the unemployment recipients fairly. Please join me in pressing the red button to defeat, defeat this amendment. And Mr. Speaker, I ask for a division vote. Chair, recognize Senator Ventine. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, go on. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Mr. Speaker. Was I recognized? Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right, guys, I understand, all right? Labor after lunch, not probably the cool thing. I've been watching people. I know we're all falling asleep from our wonderful lunch we had from the Real Estate Association. So I'm going to probably be brief and provide some facts here. State of New Hampshire, if you get unemployment benefits and for some reason you don't shouldn't have received them, you have to pay it back with interest. Fifteen states in this country do that. Another 20 do not, but the, the balance of them, they take it from you some other way. If there's an income tax in your state, they will take your income tax return. Okay? They can levy your wages. We don't do any of that in New Hampshire. Okay? It's simple. If you are, have committed fraud, the fraud unit comes after you. But there's a lot of these gray areas in between. And this is the New Hampshire way of not going after anybody for making mistakes, but kind of on the bubble of were they mistakes or were you just not quite telling the truth. These are examples. Someone gets laid off, excuse me, someone quits. Then goes to unemployment securities, this is a true story, and says, um, I, I, uh, I got, five, excuse me, they quit, someone comes back and says, I got laid off. So they get benefits. And what happens is the department sends something to the employer. The employer writes back, no, they quit. That individual had to pay that money back. Another situation where someone, a seasonal employee, received a bonus when they left at the end of the season. Well, according to Unemployment Securities, you need to report that. They didn't. They received that bonus at the same time they were receiving unemployment benefits. That's wrong. That's fraudulent. But the department doesn't want to go after everybody for some of these small infractions. Sometimes the department is wrong. At a situation where a woman went for a job, went and got some training. She was paid while she was training that day. She did not report the income. She didn't end up taking the job, didn't like the job, did not report the income. But then two weeks later, dawned on her when she filled out the form, I have to say that I received this income. She went for a hearing. The hearings officer said, Okay, we, we would think that's a mistake. We're not going to ask you to pay that back. It is very common in the state of New Hampshire to allow departments to have uh, decision-making authority on these things. It, it, it's well known in the Department of Labor. If you do not have workers' compensation, it's a $2,500 fine plus $100 a day per person per day. The department doesn't always go after people for $50,000 because they didn't have workers' compensation for six months if they de deemed it was a mistake. So they'll come up with a fine, that they'll agree on something for about $2,500. That's the New Hampshire way of doing things. That's a may versus a shall. We talked about that. Someone brought that up earlier today, a may versus a shall in our laws. That's what this amendment tries to do, make it a may versus a shall. Give the discretion through rulemaking to allow the department to go after the, the people that are really fraudulent and the people that kind of make a mistake and don't quite tell the whole story or whatever. We don't want to cause a problem where we're going after people. That's not what New Hampshire does. All the benefits are paid 100% by the employer into the work, uh, unemployment fund. We should not allow people to be able to get funds they don't deserve because it will hurt the people that do deserve those unemployment benefits. The amendment allows the department to go to rules and to be able to make these decisions so they can be fair with people. This one, it either, this thing about we pay interest, 
we charge you interest. Nope, now we're not going to charge you any interest. Why? Why are we going from here to there? There was a, some discussion that we don't trust the department. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I serve on the unemployment, uh, the, the unemployment Securities Advisory Board. We look at these guys every quarter. We have a meeting. We check and see what they, they do. And let me tell you something. During COVID, those people worked really hard. They worked 12 hours a day to make sure people got their unemployment benefits. I have no qualms whatsoever with the decisions that Unemployment Securities has made. And I've never heard anyone complain about it. I would ask you to go with the amendment. It's the New Hampshire way. It's the fair way. And it cuts this down the middle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator Sullivan has asked for a division vote. Members, take your seats. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is Amendment 1799. This is a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative LeClerc for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My name is Dan LeClerc, and I'm one of four representatives from Amherst. It's my first time up here. Mr. Speaker, if I know that it is not difficult to make a mistake when filing for weekly unemployment benefits, and if I know that there is no malicious intent to collect more than what was owed in weekly benefits, and if I also know that the recipient is willing to pay the full amount of the employment back to the Department of Employment Security, then, Mr. Speaker, would I push the red button so as not to cause an even higher burden on a person that has been collecting unemployment benefits and avoid the interest fees? Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Infantine for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the amendment makes a decent bill a lot better and will be good for employers and employees, would I vote for the amendment? Vote green, please. Motion before us is the amendment 1799. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All member present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 186 yeas, 187 nays. The amendment fails. The motion before us now is an auto pass. 
chair recognizes Representative Infantine. Missed it by that much. One of my concerns, having done this for a number of years, is seeing how other states do things. The departments in New Hampshire are so much different than some of the states to our, state to our east and our south as to how they deal with people. And I'm concerned that by passing this bill, we will put employment securities in a position where they won't give these people a pass anymore. One of these examples I gave, it was $800 that was, had to be returned. The other one was $300, and the other one was $133. Will they consider these just fraud and go after more? I think it's a good possibility, and I think that is a darn shame. I, I, I always question why we mess with something that's not broken. I would ask you to vote no on the bill. Chair recognizes Representative Sullivan. I succeeded by this much. <laughs> I want to set the record straight. This is not about trust for the Department of Employment Security. Um, I have, I would expect an equal amount of respect for uh, those folks as uh, my chairman does. Um, this is just about defining exactly where the line is um, for where you uh, charge interest or don't. And uh, you know, I think the uh, the bills that came from the other side of the wall um, made it pretty clear if. You engaged in misrepre intentional misrepre bleh, misrepresentation, then you're going to pay interest. If it re reaches the level of fraud, you're probably going to go to jail. Um, but the bottom line is, if it was an honest mistake and errors are commonly made, then there will be no interest. You'll pay back the amount that you weren't entitled to, but you won't pay any interest. So I think it's, it's a fair line to draw. If, you, if it's a mistake, no interest. If it's intentional, you pay interest. So I ask you to support uh, the bill as it uh, came to this body. Thank you. Motion before us is ought to pass in Senate Bill 42. Are you ready for the question? Are you ready for the question? The vision has been called. Members, take your seats. Representative Sweeney requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. The motion before us is ought to pass on Senate Bill 42. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Infantine for a parliamentary inquiry. Representative Infantine waves off. Chair recognizes Representative. Representative Solo waves off. Okay. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. It's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
While well, members present had an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 196 voting A, 178 voting A, committee report is adopted. The majority of the Committee on Labor, Industrial, and Rehabilitative Services to Richards referred Senate Bill 193, an act relative to the obligation of collective bargaining units to negotiate in good faith. Having considered the same report, the same with the following amendment, and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment, Representative Brian Seaworth for the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Lino Avalani for the minority of the committee. The amendment is 1800H, printed in House Record 27 on page 48. Questions on the amendment? You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. Aye. All right then, the ayes have it. And the amendment is adopted. The question now is on the report of ought to pass with amendment. Representative Avalani is recognized to speak against the report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've heard bills, a few bills this year that try to legislate items that should be part of the contract negotiation process. In my experience as a member of this committee, we have tried to make sure the negotiations between labor and management have not been subject to intrusions by state law. While there are items in law that set dates for specific budgetary deadlines, this bill tries to define a bargaining process by creating an arbitrary number of days to begin the negotiation process. It is a minority position that this is an item that should be negotiated for and not placed in state law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sullivan is recognized to speak in support of the report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I rise in support of SB 193. SB 193 is a simple bill that will help keep public sector negotiations operating efficiently. It requires public sector employees, employers, and employee groups to meet ne to ne for negotiations within 10 business days after one party or the other has provided a written request. <clears throat> this timeline can be waived through mutual agreement. It is unusual for an employer or an employee group to delay meeting with the other party. When it does happen, though, it's a sign of significant dysfunction. It has been argued uh, that the legislature should not interfere with the parties during negotiations. I would generally agree that issues should be worked out between the parties. In this case, the parties are showing that they are unable or unwilling to work things out. By passing SB 193, we will provide the, uh, the gentle nudge needed to keep negotiations moving along. We are not telling them what to negotiate or what to agree on. We're simply telling them to engage in the process. RSA 273A already requires the parties to meet. This bill simply puts a definition on how soon they must meet. The Public Employee Labor Relations Board would enforce this rule, but it would not likely be needed as a 10 business day requirement would be easy to comply with. Please push the green button to support this bipartisan piece of legislation. And Mr. Speaker, I request a division vote. Questions on the majority report of ought to pass as amended. Are you ready for the question? Well, does somebody say division? This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats.
Questions on the report of OCHA pass as amended. This is a division vote. Representative Infantine is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the Labor Committee does not like to get involved with dictating rules and procedures for negotiations and municipal contracts, if I know that this is better left up to the NLRB to decide, and that creating an arbitrary amount of days as 10 days to define what is bad faith is doing exactly what the committee does not like to do, I would ask you to vote no. Representative Bouchard is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I believe it is the obligation of the public employer and the certified employee organization to negotiate in good faith, and Mr. Speaker, if I believe good faith involves meeting at a reasonable time and place. And, Mr. Speaker, if I believe that good faith means to meet within 10 business days after receipt of a written request from the other party to meet, to bargain, then, Mr. Speaker, would I press the green button in support of our to pass SB 193? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is on the committee report of OCHA pass as amended. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 200 in the affirmative, 171 in the negative. The report is adopted. Committee on Municipal and County Government, to which was reserved, referred Senate Bill 110 FN Local relative to residency status, comes to us without recommendation. Representative Majority moves ought to pass. Representative Richard Brown is recognized to speak against the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, fellow representatives. The analysis of this bill states that its intent is to clarify residency of transient individuals for the purpose of determining, determining responsibility for local assistance. Instead of clarifying, however, the bill makes the process more difficult and unclear. Current IRSA states that any person unable to support themselves is entitled to temporary assistance. IRSA also already specifies that costs are to be paid for by the town of residence of the person. This bill restricts a person's rights by placing a 30-day restriction on an individual, requiring them to support themselves without municipal or other provider assistance in order to transition residency to a new munici municipality and would restrict someone's ability to choose their place of residence based on a homeless or transient condition. How can a homeless person support themselves and possibly their family without assistance? 
the bill appears to be more about changes in residency than about remuneration for services rendered. This bill is completely unnecessary and actually makes things more difficult for those who find themselves homeless. Please vote against this motion of ought to pass by pressing the red button so another motion can be made and brought to the floor. Thank you. Representative Priest is recognized to speak in support of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to uh, speak for the motion to ought to pass Senate Bill 110 relative to residency status. This bill clarifies the resi residency status of transient individuals to determine responsibility for local assistance. New Hampshire has experienced an increase of homeless people and families. According to the New Hampshire Coalition to End Homelessness, the number of unsheltered homeless people have doubled since 2000. And this has affected all communities in New Hampshire. SB 110 is a bipartisan initiative that will establish a common ground, fair, and equitable agreement on residency concerning people receiving services from hospitals, correctional facilities, treatment program centers, emergency temporary housing services and placements outside of a municipal municipality of origin. Clarification of residency for local welfare purposes only will increase municipal liability fairness while continuing to comply with the humanitarian obligations as indicated in our current um, RSA. By clarifying the residency status for transient individuals, this bill opens up the communication and collaboration of assistance between the resident community and the community providing services. If you believe in fairness and equitable agreement between municipalities, I urge all of you to pass the green button and support the ought to pass SB 110. And I ask for a division vote. Thank you. Question is on the motion of ought to pass on Senate Bill 110. Make the roll call. Representative Chir Len Turcott requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? Yep. This will be a roll call vote. Members, please take your seats. The question is on the motion of ought to pass on Senate Bill 110, and this is a roll call vote. Representative Len Turcotte is recognized for parliamentary inquiry, and it would be nice if we could hear him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know this bill comes to the House floor without recommendation and came out of our committee in a nonpartisan vote, and if I know this bill is as much about changes in residency status as it is about ensuring transients are taken care of, 
And if I further know our laws already speak to how the costs for transients paid for one town are to be recovered from the town where that trans transient currently resides. And finally, Mr. Speaker, if I know this bill confuses and complicates the issue rather than clarifies an already clear existing statute, would I now press the red button so another motion can be made? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Gilman is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that all municipalities are required to assist persons in need but have varying capacity for that responsibility and thus request the assistance of surrounding communities with no mention of costs involved, and if I know that SB 110 clarifies the legal municipal residency of people who have been released from incarceration, hospitalization, or a short-term assistance program, and if I know this bill requires, rather than suggests, municipal welfare officers to coordinate care and costs so that no one community takes an unequal burden for the needs of a resident from any New Hampshire municipality. Would I then press the green button to support equitable municipal responsibility for emergency quality of life care? Questions on the motion about to pass on SB 110. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 190 in the affirmative, 180 in the negative. The motion is adopted. The Committee on Municipal and County Governments, which was referred to Senate Bill 132 FN, prohibiting cities and towns from adopting sanctuary policies, comes to us without recommendation. For what reason does a member rise? To make a motion, Mr. Speaker. State your motion. I move to table. SB 132, and I request a division vote. Representative Stavis moves that Senate Bill 132 be laid on the table. Representative Len Turcott requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
The question is whether to lay Senate Bill 132 on the table. And this is a roll call vote. Representative Davis is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this bill, in some form or fashion, has come before the House at least three times in the past, and each time we have seen fit to defeat or table it, whatever party held the majority, and we did that because it is an improper imposition of federal law onto our communities where citizens elect officials to represent their interests, not to do Washington's bidding. And if I know that this bill represents a sweeping prohibition against implementing immigration policies promulgated by the state on behalf of the federal government, and it's an abrogation of local control, and if I also know that in this instant, it makes our citizens who serve in local government at risk of investigations and lawsuits over the very words they speak or the informal actions they take, and if I know that the costs of those lawsuits will be borne by taxpayers, would I not press the green button and support the tabling motion? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Len Chirkos, recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that our state needs to promote law and order when the federal government fails to do so, and if I also realize that our towns and cities and the law enforcement agencies of those municipalities should never impede the apprehension of detained criminal aliens by immigration and custom enforcement by intentionally employing policies that do just that, impede, and finally, and most importantly, if I know that this issue has been misrepresent misrepresented by many individuals and parties, would I now press the red button so the floor debates on the amendment and the main uh, motion can get a full airing? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is whether lay SB 132 on the table, and this is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 203 and the affirmative, 168 in the negative. Senate Bill 132 was laid on the table. The Committee on Resources, Recreation, and Development, to which was referred Senate Bill 60, an act relative to water quality. Having considered the same report, the same with the following amendments and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass. With amendment, Representative Suzanne Vale for the committee. The committee amendment is 1635H, printed in House Record 2, pages 30 to 32. The question is on the amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The bill is on second reading and open to further amendment. Representative Hines moves floor amendment 1840H, printed on House Record 27, on pages 32 to 34. Representative Hines is recognized to speak to his amendment.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a Christmas tree bill uh, for marijuana legalization that the House already passed uh, overwhelmingly. So I'm asking that we put it on something that the Senate overwhelmingly wants. Now that the coroner office has taken a slightly different position on marijuana, uh, maybe that will lead to the people on the other side also flip-flopping. So I ask for your support to legalize marijuana. Thank you. Representative Vail is recognized to speak against the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, honorable leaders, I rise in opposition to Amendment 1840H as this is an attempt to keep alive language related to cannabis that the other body will never concur with. And for that reason, please vote no on Amendment 1840H so that we can vote on the bill as amended by the committee. It is an important bill. Thank you so much. The question is on Amendment 1840H. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. The nays have it, and the amendment fails. The question now is on the motion of ought to pass on Senate Bill 60. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay? Aye. The ayes have it, and the report is adopted. The Committee on Resources, Recreation, and Development, to which was referred Senate Bill 160 FN, an act relative to the use of OHRVs on designated trails and requiring a permit to operate certain OHRVs from before sunrise to after sunset. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment, Representative Suzanne's bail for the committee. The committee amendment is 1519H, Printed and House Record 27 on page 46. The question's on the amendment. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay? Nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment's adopted. The bill's on second reading and open to further amendment. Representative Hines moves floor amendment 1825H, printed in House Record 27 on pages 46 to 47, and is recognized to speak to his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is attaching another bill that the House passed, this one related to our self-defense. Um, so I ask that you uh, support my amendment that repeals the prohibition on brass knuckles and blackjacks. I think if we have a right to self-defense of lethal force, we also have the right to self-defense for non-lethal force. So I ask that you support our Second Amendment rights and support the amendment. Thank you. Representative Muse is recognized to speak against the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The amendment now before us would end our state's current prohibition on carrying or possessing with the intent to sell blackjacks, brass knuckles, and slingshots. Um, we've been here before, uh, and I know that there are always things that we can do to try to make a good bill an even better bill, but passing this amendment is not one of them. Uh, this particular amendment uh, has been opposed by the New Hampshire State Police as well as by the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association, and it's being opposed for a very good reason. If this policy were put into place, it not only would jeopardize the safety of law enforcement officers, it would also jeopardize the safety of the students in our schools, anyone who goes into a bar, or any type of public accommodation, and basically any person walking down a street. So please, please join with our law enforcement community in opposing this unnecessary and harmful change to a very, very good bill that really does deserve to pass. Thank you. The question is on floor amendment 1825H. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. 
No. The nays have it, and the amendment fails. The question now is on the adoption of ought to pass with amendments on Senate Bill 60. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the report's adopted. The Committee on Science, Technology, and Energy, to which is referred Senate Bill 54FN, an act relative to purchase power agreements for electric distribution utilities. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Michael votes for the committee. The committee amendment is 1586H, printed on House Record 27 on pages 27 to 28. The question is on the committee amendment. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it. And the amendments adopt. The bill is on second reading and open to further amendment. Representative McGee moves floor amendment 1652H, printed on House Record 27 on page 28. Representative Vos is recognized to speak in support of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The committee amendment that we just adopted implemented eight of the nine changes that our committee wanted to make to the Senate Bill 54. The ninth change got lost somewhere between our committee room and OLS. So this floor amendment implements that ninth change. If you look on page 27 of your calendar, down near the bottom of the page, you'll see a definition for new electric energy sources. And you'll note that at the end of that sentence is the phrase, at a site where no facility previously existed. Then if you turn the page to page 28 and you look at the floor amendment, you'll discover that that phrase has been eliminated from that sentence. That's important because Senate Bill 54 allows utilities to implement purchase power agreements with newly constructed energy sources. But without this amendment, it would prohibit an energy source that's built on a site of an existing energy source to be considered. So for example, the Merrimack Station coal plant in Bow, if that was torn down and replaced with a solar facility, that solar facility wouldn't be eligible to participate in these PPAs under Senate Bill 54 unless this phrase is removed. Therefore, we ask you to pass this floor amendment and then pass Senate Bill 54. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is on the adoption of Amendment 1652H. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment's adopted. The question now is on the motion of ought to pass as amended on Senate Bill 54. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. All right, then. The ayes have it, and the report is adopted. The Committee on the Special Committee on Child Care, to which was referred Senate Bill 94, an act relative to residential child care licensing of child care institutions and agencies. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Rebecca McWilliams for the committee. The amendment is 1810H, printed in House Record 27 on page 39. Questions on the adoption of the amendment. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. 
Representative McWilliams has requested a division vote. This will be a division vote on ought to pass as amended. Members, please take your seats. Questions on the adoption of ought to pass as amended on Senate Bill 94. This is a division vote. Representative McWilliams is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the House Special Committee on Child Care is dedicated to the task at hand, and we are passing two bills, two child care bills today, and I know that this is a very important one, and Mr. Speaker, if I also know that the House Special Committee on Child Care has been doing listening sessions across the state, having recently completed one in Conway and planning to have another one on the seacoast shortly for you to report to your constituents, and if I further know that this bill as amended was unanimously supported out of committee and modernizes several of the terminology definitions that we use for child care in New Hampshire for the 21st century, would I then press the green button to support this unanimous, positive move in the right direction for child care in New Hampshire? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is ought to pass as amended on Senate Bill 94. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 329 in the affirmative, 34 in the negative. The report's adopted.
House will come to order. The Majority Committee on Transportation to which was referred Senate Bill 118 FN, an act requiring children under the age of two years to be strained in a motor vehicle. Having considered the same, report the same with the recommendation that the bill ought to pass. Representative George Sykes for the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution that it is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Ted Gorski for the minority of the committee. Chair recognizes Representative Leon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise today in opposition to the ought to pass motion on its Senate Bill 118. This bill would change our current car seat law, which requires children under the age of seven and under the height of four feet nine inches to be restrained in a motor vehicle, and would add the requirement that under the age of two, they would be rear facing, regardless of their size, the weight, or the manufacturer requirements of the seat. Proponents of this bill believe that children under two being in a rear-facing rear car seat is an easy way to increase child safety, but they don't realize the unintended consequences. The two biggest pro problems here are that this law will tell parents that when their child turns two, it's time to turn them forward-facing, and there's also the problem of car seats that will not fit into the vehicle. So car seats have changed a lot since many of you have had car seats, and they've changed in the 11 years that I've been in the market. They're a lot easier to install, and as the move towards extended rear facing happens, they're getting bigger and bigger. It's great for safety, but it's not so good for families with small cars. I have a giant Sequoia SUV and a mid-sized sedan. With my third car child, it was very, very hard to find an infant car seat that would fit in the sedan with all five members of the family. It was absolutely impossible to find a larger rear-facing seat, once he sized out of the baby seat, that would allow us all to sit in the car. That meant we took two cars. For some families, that means you need to buy a second vehicle or buy a new vehicle because you can't all fit in the car. So while there's organizations that will provide a rear-facing car seat for families, there's no organizations that help you get a new car if you don't fit. So the biggest problem here is saying that the age, at age two, you can turn your child forward facing. Last session, we saw a bill like this that turned into a study committee. I was on that committee along with the prime sponsor of this bill. We had a lot of experts that came in and testified to us. And you might be surprised to know, but each one of you would be safer if you were riding in a car rear facing. Every single one of you would be safer, except the driver wouldn't be able to see the road. <laughs> so, as we look at this, we also had documentation of what happens in car accidents in New Hampshire, especially with children under age two. 96% of Granite State children in the last two years involved in car traffic accidents were in rear-facing car seats. That means 4% weren't following what would be law. The state police testified that they're doing a great job when they get 7% compliance. So this is quite honestly not necessary. And even worse, it's harmful. Right now, if you ask your pediatrician how long to keep your child rear facing, the answer is as long as you can. Having three and four year olds rear facing is safest. And if you can do it, you should. The problem is, you hit your second birthday, you turn forward facing, and you lose that safety on those three and four year olds that otherwise would stay in a rear facing seat. Uh, we do actually have uh, some junior members here in the infant car seats because some people will tell you that you come home from the hospital where you're facing. I can pretty much guarantee you that a year from now, neither of them will fit into those infant seats, and they may need to purchase another rear-facing seat by then. So there's a lot of unintended consequences, and parents are already keeping their children rear-facing if they can. This is unnecessary, potentially harmful, and I ask for you to overturn this motion so that a better motion can be made. Thank you. Would the member yield for a question? Yes. The member yields. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I feel much more comfortable doing this backwards. <laughs> I've heard that most, most parents uh, who go to these, uh, these car seat check stations uh, or, or uh, things with the, the fire department and the police uh, have their car seats installed backwards or wrong or, or whatever. Um, how can we possibly? 
expect to trust parents with this? Well, thank you for the question. Um, there actually was testimony in committee that over 90% of people at the car check stations did not have them installed correctly. But that's because most people can figure it out, and if you don't, there are lots of advertised places for car speed specialists to help you make sure it's right. We should applaud these parents. They had a question, they got it fixed, and now their kids are safe. And that's not really a good data point. Would the member yield for a second question? Yes. The member does yield. Thank you for taking my question. Is it not true that young children have weaker necks, much bigger heads, and skulls that have not fused? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, a newborn's head is 25% of its weight, and for us, it's 6% of our weight. And children's necks don't, are hypermobile all the way through their teens. You don't even close all of your skull sutures until you reach your 20s. That's a good reason why we should keep the law the way it is, which encourages parents to keep their children rear-facing as long as possible, instead of telling them that it's safe to turn them forward-facing at two years. Would the member yield for a third question? Thank you, the member yields. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have spoken to parents, and I'm wondering if in this bill there's any exception for extenuating circumstances. I had a mom who had a torn esophagus, and for her maneuvering, um, to, she couldn't physically pull her child out from the rear-facing position because of the setup of her car and the seat. Um, in this situation, would there be any exception for her? She turned the seat around temporarily until her esophagus healed and then um, put it back rear-facing. Is there any exception for something like that? Thank you for the question. There is no exception for that or any other reason. Would the member yield for a fourth question? Yes, this the is member the last yields. Question. This will be the final question. Thank you. If we pass this bill, how will we compare to other states? Uh, thank you very much for the question. My data is from last year's study committee. Um, last year, we were one of 30 states that had no law on rear facing. There was, there are two states, sorry, there's nine states that require children under one to be rear facing, but eight of those allow a certain, eight, if they're over 20 pounds, to move to forward facing. There are 13 states that require children under two to be rear facing, but if they're too tall, too heavy, or they're outside manufacturer um, guidelines, then they can move forward facing. If we pass this, we'll be one of five states, even more restrictive than California, that don't even have a weight lim limit or a height limit. I think we should trust to the experts that say rear face as long as possible and trust the parents and vote this down. Thank you. The chair rep recognizes Representative Rombo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today in support of the House Transportation Majority's recommendation of ought to pass for SB 118. SB 118 calls for children under the age of two years old to be restrained in a rear-facing child car seat and motor vehicle. The bill seeks to keep children under the age of two years old safer when traveling in a vehicle in the event of a collision. It includes an exception for children under age two who exceed the relevant weight minimums. If you've left a hospital as a parent with a newborn in recent years, you may remember hospital staff ensuring that you had safely secured your baby in a rear-facing seat before allowing you to drive home. That's because the medical and scientific community consensus is clear. The mechanical engineering and physics of rear-facing car seats make it far and away the safest way to travel by car for children ages zero to two. Rear-facing car seats ensure adequate time for children to develop, and using the correct car seat can reduce injuries and death. A newborn's head makes up about 25% of its body weight. The younger a child is, the less form the neck muscles. Most accidents are forward-moving collisions, making it crucial to protect a newborn's neck and skull upon impact. As the Brain Injury Association of America has noted, the symptoms of a brain injury in children may be similar to those experienced by an adult, but the functional impact can be very different. The cognitive impairments of a child with a brain injury may not be immediately obvious after the injury and may only become apparent as the child gets older. 
The majority of parents do use these seats for their newborns and infants for some period of time. But changing the behavior around rear-facing car seats with uniformity beyond leaving the hospital requires education and inform enforcement as well as engineering. Accordingly, multiple nonprofit agencies concerned with these safety issues testified in committee in favor of this bill. Dartmouth Health, AAA, and the American Academy of Pediatrics all support rear-facing car seats for children, younger children. This bill would not overlap with existing laws in New Hampshire. Dozens of experts, legislators, and citizens, including parents, have expressed their support for this bill in hearings. Not a single group or individual contested the safety aspect of this bill. Rear-facing car seats are not more expensive than front-facing car seats, which are already required by law for this age group. In fact, convertible car seats can be cost savers because they can face backwards for the first two years and then be faced forward to accommodate a larger weight and age range, thus lasting longer. In addition, Dartmouth Health is committed to providing rear-facing car seats for families in need. One child injury is too many. If we can prevent that injury, we should try. We often talk about weighing whether proposed safety legislation imposes too great a burden or restriction on an individual's autonomy. This bill does not interfere with a child's ability to engage in any activity you would otherwise have available. To the contrary, it preserves our children's chances to walk and run and live their most active lives going forward. This bill will help protect our most vulnerable passengers. They're already required to be restrained in a car seat at this age. This bill simply calls for the safest, posi safest positioning. Brain injury prevention is responsible, common sense public policy. While this legislation was voted down on the other side of the wall the last time it came up in 2021, it has now been passed by a voice vote by the other body. I ask that you vote to keep our newborns and infants safe on our roads and to provide our families with the legal enforcement framework to do the same. I ask you to support the majority recommendation of OTP on SB 118 and push the green button so that SB 118 may pass. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would request a division vote, please. Question before the House is the ought to pass motion on Senate Bill 118. A division vote has been requested. This will be a division vote. The question before us is on the Automash motion on Senate Bill 118. This will be a division vote. Members, please take their seats. Chair recognizes Representative Gorski for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I know that today when a parent asks their pediatrician how long they should keep their child rear facing, the right answer is as long as you can. And if I know that this bill, if this bill passes, the answer will be, you can turn your child forward facing when they turn two. Would I then, in the interest of child safety, press the red button so a more appropriate motion can be made? Chair recognizes Representative Crawford for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I know that this bill fills a much needed gap in child safety, and if I know that this bill does not overlap any other existing law and has tremendous bipartisan support and was passed unanimously by the chamber behind us, and if I know that car crashes are the leading cause of death for children ages one through 13, and Madam Speaker, if I know 
the Chiefs of Police, New Hampshire Highway Safety, Brain Injury Association, AAA, Dartmouth, Hitchcock, and Concord Pediatrics all support this bill, then, Madam Speaker, would I now vote to support this bill and protect those who cannot protect themselves and agree with the committee report of ought to pass by pushing the green bud. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The question before us is on ought to pass on Senate Bill 118. This will be a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had the opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. With 192 in the affirmative, 173 in the negative, the ought to pass motion passes. The majority of the Committee on Transportation to which was referred Senate Bill 256FN, an act establishing a safety program for off-highway recreational vehicles. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Daniel Veyu for the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report that the following resolution that is inexpedient to legislate, Representative Ted Gorski, for the minority of the committee. Question before us is on the amendment 1570H, printed in House Record 27 on page 52. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. The question before us now is uh, ought to pass as amended, and the chair recognizes Representative Gorski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I stand in opposition to SB 256. Now, Madam Speaker, when I think about this bill, it reminds me of the National Football League. And you may ask, how does it relate to that? Well, many years ago, the National Football League also stood for the No Fun League. And when I think of this bill, I look at it as the, the No Fun Bill. Now, why the NFL was cracking down was it was cracking down on celebrations in terms of having fun. And this is exactly what this bill does. This bill legislates fun. Now, how does it do it? Well, we're talking about off-highway recreational vehicles. So you may be asking yourself, well, what is an off-highway recreational vehicle? Well, according to the definition, it is used in a public way for a pleasure or recreational purposes. It runs on rubber, tires, tracks, or a cushion of air. It depends on the ground or other surface for travel. And lastly, has an operator who sits on the vehicle. Now, Madam Speaker, if this bill passes, one of the things it requires is that all various individuals will need to attend five hours of training to run these vehicles. Talk about legislation of fun. George Bernard Shaw once said, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. If this law passes, it could also have a negative impact to the, our New Hampshire recreational industry. So I ask you, 
pressing the red button is a vote for fun. So I ask you to vote for fun so we can ITL this bill so a new motion can be made. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The chair recognizes Representative Veyu. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Colleagues, I rise to speak in support of SB 256, which establishes a safety certification program for off-highway recreational vehicles, or OHRVs, which include ATVs, all-terrain vehicles, all utility terrain vehicles, or UTVs, side-by-sides, and gators. This program will only apply to recreational uses of OHRVs. Operators who work on farms or on construction sites will be exempt from this program. This bill has re been referred to as the No Fun Bill. I like to refer to it as the Fun Preservation Bill. There will be two levels There'll be two levels of certification, the temporary certificate issued for anybody who wants to rent an OHRV on a temporary basis, and a lifetime certification which may be issued after completion of a more in-depth training course. OHRVs have become extremely popular in New Hampshire, especially in the North Country, where they have become an important part of the local economy, contributing an estimated $300 million and nearly 2,500 jobs in 2020 alone. While OHRVs are primarily operated off-road and established trails, they are increasingly allowed on state and local roadways, giving riders access to gas stations, restaurants, lodging, and other amenities where they support local businesses. The proposed safety certification program seeks to address some major areas of concern that have arisen as the sport's popularity has, has grown. Firstly, many of the trails these vehicles use traverse private property with the permission of landowners. As more operators take advantage of the sport, cases have increased where riders have deviated from the established trails, trespassed on private land, and caused significant property damage to farms, woodlands, and wetlands. Consequently, many landowners have become hesitant to allow access to trails, which poses a threat to the sport and local economies that have become to rely on it. A comprehensive safety certification program aims to preserve good relationships with landowners by informing operators about these concerns and educating them on responsible ridership and the importance of following proper trail etiquette. Secondly, OHRVs, as OHRVs, some of which are as big and powerful as cars, are increasingly allowed to operate on state and, lo state and local highways. Safety training will also, also focus on participants, and on, one second, will also focus on educating participants about the rules of the road. Participants will be taught the specific laws and regulations governing the use of OHRVs on public roads, ensuring they understand their rights and responsibilities as operators. They will learn about speed limits, traffic signs, signaling, reducing excess noise as they drive through neighborhoods, and other crucial aspects of safe, courteous operation. Additionally, participants will receive guidance on sharing the road with other vehicles, following proper lane discipline, and practicing defensive driving techniques. Lastly, OHRV tra safety training will cover the physical risks and limitations of these vehicles when operating on paved roadways. These can include things that people who have been riding for their entire lives may not be aware of. Participants will learn about the unique characteristics of OHRVs such as their size, weight, and handling capabilities, and how these factors affect their operation on paved roadways versus dirt trails. Tires designed for off-road conditions may perform very differently on paved roadways, affecting steering, acceleration, and braking distances. Operators will be educated about the importance of understanding turning radius and maneuvering limitations specific to OHR OHRVs. By understanding the physical risks and limitations of their vehicles, participants can make informed decisions while operating on roadways, adjusting their driving behavior to ensure their safety and the safety of others. Or they will risk losing their, their certificate as they would their driver's license. This knowledge empowers participants, even those who have been, may have been operating for decades, to make responsible choices and adapt their driving style according to the capabilities and limitations of their OHRVs, reducing the risk of damage to private property, preventing accidents, and promoting safer road usage. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would the member yield for a question? No, I will not. The member does not yield. 
The question before us is on the question of ought to pass as amended on Senate Bill 256. Are you ready for the question? A division vote has been requested. This will be a division vote. Members, please take their seats. Roll call has been requested by Representative Ammon. Has that been sufficiently se seconded? Yes. It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members will please take their seats. The House will come to order. The Chair recognizes Representative Gorski for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If I know that this bill will require a five-hour training course for many of our constituents who want to ride an OHRV, and if I know that this bill, this no-fund bill, could have a negative impact on New Hampshire's recreational industry, would I then, in the interest of fun, press the red button so a more appropriate motion can be made? The chair recognizes Representative Sykes for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I know that this is a bill, sorry, I'm having, I, new eyeglass issues, I apologize about that. If I know that the popularity of OHRVs has surged in New Hampshire, particularly in the North Country, where it has become one of the mainstays of its economy, and if I also know that OHRVs are powerful motor vehicles that are primarily operated off-road but also do operate on established roads, and one way to help improve the maintenance and preservation of trails is to have people who are trained on how to operate those vehicles, keeping more private land available for trails. And finally, and most importantly, that if I know OHRVs are, do in fact increasingly operate on roadways, and it's critical to ensure that the operators are aware of the rules of the road, as well as the performance limitation of their vehicles. Many of these that got rented come right, right as part of that rental agreement. They're told that they should not operate this particular vehicle because of its tires on hard pavement. But many people don't realize that. And the training program will help establish that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And would I now press the green button to, to support the majority committee report? The question before us is on that ought to pass as amended motion on Senate Bill 256. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are now open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had the opportunity to vote? The House will tend to the state of the vote. With 186 in the affirmative, 179 in the negative, the motion passes. The House will come to order. 
The Committee on Ways to Means, which was referred, Senate Bill 49 FN, an act relative to creating a dedicated non-lapsing fund and a biennial report of such fund for OPLC. Having considered the same, report the same with the recommendation that the bill ought to pass. Representative Jordan Ullery for the committee. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the motion is adopted. House will now attend to the bills removed from consent. The Committee on Election Law to which was referred CACR 9, an act relating to the New Hampshire presidential primary, providing that New Hampshire presidential primary will be the first presidential primary of a presidential election cycle. We consider the same, report the same with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate Senator Ross Berry for the committee. For what purpose the member rise? Motion, Mr. Speaker. State your motion. I move to lay CACR 9 on the table. That is a proper motion. Did somebody request the roll call? Is that sufficiently seconded? No, it's not sufficiently seconded. The motion before us is table CACR 9. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. No. I think it's been put on the table. Committee on Executive Departments and Administration to which was referred Senate Bill 107, act relative to general administration of regulatory boards and commissions. Considered the same, report the same with the following amendment, the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. I'm Senator Tony Likas for the committee. The amendment is 2012H, printed in House Record 27, pages 39 through 45. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Bills on second reading open to further amendment. The, it's floor amendment 2075H, printed in House Record 27, pages 45 through 46. The chair recognizes Representative Carol McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As everybody in eDNA and maybe one or two others know as well, this year we completely recodified the statute governing the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification. We took, took it out of one RSA and moved it into a new one with, and major revisions at the same time. That's fine, except that we also had a whole bunch of other bills that affected other licensing statutes that referred to the, uh, the OPLC statute. And they couldn't refer to the correct new statute because it didn't exist yet. It refers to the old statute. But we still don't want to ignore those items. So this amendment gives the Enrolled Bills Committee and OLS the authority to say, oh, this is an OPLC bill, instead of going to this RSA, which doesn't exist anymore, we put it in the new one. It is purely to allow them to take care of this mechanical process and keep us from having a whole slew of bills next year to do it ourselves. So I, and since I would be dealing with it next year, I hope you will support this amendment. Thank you. Motion before us is Floor Amendment 2075H. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the floor amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is auto pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee, mem committee motion amendment is adopted. The chair recognizes the member from Auburn, Representative Osborne, for the third reading motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Resolved that the House now adjourn from the early session, that the business of the late session be in order at the present time, that the reading of bills be by title only and resolutions by caption only, and that all bills ordered to third reading be read a third time by this resolution, and that all titles of bills be the same as adopted and that they be passed at the present time. And when the House adjourns today, it be to meet Thursday, June 15th at 10 a.m. That's my birthday. Thank you. We still got something to do. The question is on the third reading motion. Are you, the House will be in order. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And the motion is adopted. The House will attend to announcements. Chair recognizes Representative DeSimone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today the owls met. Thank you. Uh, and we decided to meet again next week at lunchtime in the Webster Room, and this will be an organizational meeting. We need Republicans and Democrats to come to the next meeting so that we can elect a president, vice president, and so forth down the line. It's a great group. Please join us, men and women. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Maggiore and Moffat. Go ahead. The House will be in order. <laughs> you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just wanted to remind everyone about the Legislative Golf Classic. Which will be held Monday, June 26, starting at 8.30 a.m. At Loudoun Country Club, Shotgun Start. Shotgun? Shotgun. <laughs> We've had a lot of folks sign up already, but there's still plenty of room for those who want to sign up. There will be lots of raffle prizes. And prizes for the top golf teams as well. And special contests, longest drive, nearest the pin, straightest drive, best looking golfer. Best looking golfer? Just, what? Just kidding, Rep Turcott already <laughs> has been selected for that award. And we have two Rep Turcotts, so that's <laughs> Right? Oh, what was that? We have two Rep Turcotts, one we on the do. left, one on the right. We yes. do, let's, let's recognize them both. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, do we also have some people sponsoring halls? Oh, I'm sorry, I went off script and I got <laughs> sidetracked. Okay. Uh, yes, we have uh, Senator Pearl uh, representing Hall 17. He's uh, for District 17. And I think Representative Birdsell said that uh, there might be a sponsorship of the 19th hole. I believe the Beer Caucus is sponsoring the 19th hole. That's the way it should be. <laughs> uh, how, but there is a nice payoff if you make the hole in one. Sink the shot and you can win $20,000, which could buy you a used pickup truck. Or a used Prius. <laughs> uh, but more good news, there will be a hole in one prize at the other three par threes as well. Uh, thank you, Representative Infantine, for setting everything up for us. We appreciate it. There will be some great raffle prizes as well, a 50-50 raffle, a putting contest, which will be run by two of our favorite lobbyists. And if you, you don't have to be a registered golfer to participate in the putting contest, just show up with a $5 bill. The luncheon social will start around 1.30. If you're not a golfer, you can still come to the social and mix and mingle, not only with talented lawmakers, but also with big time influencers and maybe a super secret special guest. If you're not an early riser, you can still come to the social for only $20. 
But think about buying some raffle tickets. But if you also can bring some campaign signs to place around the course, you can do that. And if you don't have any campaign signs, you can recycle any old ones you may have in storage, like for Mitt Romney or Hillary Clinton. Sorry, I lost my, <laughs> I lost track. We're just Too vamping. many papers. We're <laughs> Knowing that a few of our members have been known to take a libation under extreme social pressure, be advised that the beer cart will indeed be on the move throughout the day with some familiar faces riding shotgun. Shotgun again? Sh shotgun again. Serving as a roving ranger in a separate cart will be Representative Jess Edwards. Thank you very much. Uh, his job will be to provide security and keep things moving in the interest of equity and diversity. He will be assisted by a female member of the other party who doesn't mind his cigar smoke. <laughs> and we'll have some, some great teams registered already. Rep Gorski's team, the Weapons of Grass Destruction. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> Uh, and a team uh, by, with Rep Hill and Rep Walsh for diversity, a woman named Amy Mayo. And another great team will be the team for kids. That's F-O-R-E for those golfers out there. Get it? It includes Education Committee stalwarts, Representative Myler and Representative Luno. And for diversity, it also features Representative Tanner and the Honorable Sue Mullen. Nice. Oh, so we're already off to a good start in terms of registrations. We have about 20, I think about 25. Um, but we do want to have a good time while supporting a good cause, which would be, again, Manchester's Liberty House, which helps homeless and transitioning veterans. Oh, wait, did I read You I skipped read? the whole part. I did. <laughs> You want to uh, take that one? Okay, so he was yeah. going to say, uh, don't worry, we'll have same-day registrations. I say, no, we don't want same-day registrations. But we do want to have a good time while supporting a good cause, which would be Manchester's Liberty House. <laughs> Go ahead, finish it off, Rep. Maglior. And then I'll say, it's a good cause indeed. For more information, you can represent myself, uh, represent, you can contact myself, Representative Moffat also. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you all on Monday, June 26th at Loudoun Country Club. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Chair yeah. recognizes the clerk. This won't be nearly as exciting. <laughs> Committee chairs, please come see me before you leave today uh, to go over House bills amended by the Senate. Please come up to the office or call me tomorrow uh, if you want to. Um, form committees of conference. We will be able to do that in recess. Uh, otherwise, you do need to get your reports back for next week's session. So please do come see me uh, after session upstairs or call me tomorrow. Also, please empty your seat pockets and your mailboxes in the back. Uh, there have been things growing out of some of the mailboxes in the back, and we encourage you to please empty them. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Moulton for unanimous consent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I wanted to publicly praise another member of this House. I'm not sure if he is still here or if he stepped out. Um, Representative Steve Peterson. Um, did he leave? He left? Okay. Well, that's a shame. But, oh, he is here. All right, can you come forward, Representative? No? Okay. Well, I was in a severe car accident, and he was the first responder who came to my aid. He did an excellent job, and I think he deserves a round of applause. I was just to, first of all, I don't, I don't. Secondly, I was just as surprised to see your face when I crawled through the passenger side of that car as you were to see mine, so. Um, Regardless, I just, I still feel that you did a good job and you treated me with compassion and I just felt that it would be appropriate to give you public recognition for it. So. All right. Thank you.
Chair recognizes Representative Horrigan for unanimous consent. My, my speech is, uh, my speech is uh, short. I'll make it even shorter. Um, I was, uh, we've had a good day today, a lot of bipartisanship, and I certainly don't want to want to uh, ruin that in any way. But it's just there is a uh, historical marker 278 was put up uh, well, last month on May 1st and then taken down two weeks later, which uh, honored a woman named Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, also known as the Rebel Girl. And um, I think certainly she, there were some things, uh, there's some things she did which people don't agree with now, but uh, you know, for the most part, she was a remarkable person and she uh, agrees. Uh, I think she deserved the uh, historical marker. It's, it would have been, um, at, well, she lived at 12 Montgomery Street, which is not far from the State House, and that, her house doesn't exist anymore, but they put it on the edge of the parking lot of the Merrimack Valley Courthouse, and, um, and actually some unofficial signs have sprung up there, so she's probably getting more attention than she would have gotten if they just left it up there. And um, she also happened, her family happened to be a neighbor of uh, Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, whose historical marker is still standing, and uh, I certainly think uh, Christian Science is probably an outmoded, I uh, apologize any Christian scientist, that was an outmoded uh, means of health, of uh, health care, and probably the particular political um, parties she belonged to also had what are now outmoded ideas about uh, politics and how to organize an economy, but I think the marker still, still should be put up, if not uh, on the courthouse, but somewhere. So um, I'll, uh, that's probably more than, I, more than they need to say about it, but I think that was uh, just sort of unfair. Not everybody who has an historical marker is perfect, and she said, and certainly none of us are perfect. So I would, uh, that's, uh, I'd like to urge you to say that, and I probably will. I don't know how far to go, but I think it will be exploring some way to have a resolution or a bill or something to address that issue at some point in the future. So um, thanks, and congratulations to uh, you, Mr. Speaker, and our leadership for uh, getting the budget over the line uh, so easily. It was uh, definitely, I've been through eight budgets, and that's definitely the best budget uh, by far, that we, at least the best budget process we've had by far. So thanks. Chair, Chair recognizes Representative Perez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members of the House. I'm raising today to say thank you to everyone who respect me for who I am. Many of you know English is not my first language. Many times I've been told that uh, people don't understand when I'm speaking. I'm very sorry. I try my best to speak clear as I can. And I'm here to tell not just the Democrats and Republicans, thank you for those who respect me and work with me and show me that I'm another state representative who's here to represent their constituents. But I'm very disappointed, very disappointed with people from my own party today after I make it a statement that I would not support the budget because there were certain things in the budget that I don't personally believe or respect. I was approached by people in my own body and told me that I'm one issue state representative, which I'm not. I'm asking not just Democrats and Republicans, but I work with both sides of the aisle with many issues, not just here in the State House, but with the Hillsborough County. I try to work with everyone. I feel very disappointed because I show it everywhere. And some of the people who called me out today and told me that I'm just one issue person, I want them to tell me, where have you been when I show up not just in Milford, but everywhere in the state, supporting your community when you're not there. Please tell me where you've been. And you can come in and tell me that I'm just one issue person. I want you to tell me in, your in my face 
where have you been when I spend hours and hours of my day supporting you constituents when you're not there? I want you to tell me, how can you ask me to support issues that you care, but when I ask you to support something, you call me out? Like I'm not a human, or like I don't, or my community don't, don't even matter. I'm asking you, show me your respect. Don't show the respect only when you need the vote from my community. Show them every day, every day of the year. Thank you so much. Rep Representative Wasman moved that the House stand in recess for the purpose of the introduction of bills, enrolled bill amendments, enrolled bill reports, receiving message informing committees at conference. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes, the ayes have it. And the motion is adopted. The House is in recess until Thursday, June 15, 2023, at 10 a.m.